Hey Tom, how are you? Good. How's your How's your election meeting? Um, it was It was short, and, but you know, productive. Um, okay. A couple of things. I need to talk to you about the next creatives. That you know, we need to get flyers going. Uh, Randy's okay. all excited to basically canvas up and down. Hollywood Boulevard and Franklin. Yeah. And that's certainly and that's certainly something we can send over to Henry as well. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. I mean the the question is what what kind of information do we want to include on it? Let me dig up the old flyer that we did and see if there's any, you know, because it's it's the same. The only thing that's different is the the board seats, but pretty much everything else is the same as why would you want to be a neighborhood council and you know, what are our areas and things like that. So let me see what kind of a flyer we've had before and because there's no real reason to reinvent the well, why wouldn't we just use the design that we've got for the bus bench and for the banners and oh no no we'd use that but we when you have a flyer you're going to have more content usually you know some some actual text and stuff unless you want to just keep it as you know just that same design with that same information which could be possible we could create a we i have a qr code um that takes well, you to the elections page too you know in, in the old days if we were handing them out physically i i wouldn't mind having a bunch of information on it but it, you know, again this is sort of a passing you know passing passerby kind of like encounter engagement so i think the less is more approach and get them to the website still prevails okay So we have Queens Erin Penner, are you on? Hello, hello. Do you do you have the uh, the computer? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I, Apparently, we have five of us. I am praying that. Uh, do you need me to take minutes? Even if it's recorded, I have to meet with school parents in like 45 minutes on Zoom. Ah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, wouldn't it be great if this was over in 45 minutes? <laughs> oh, I know. And it's, it's this, I, this week, I can't even tell you how bad this week is. <laughs> oh my God. But I will show you my favorite coffee mug that says, Sometimes I wake up grumpy. Sometimes I let him sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's what Lisa probably has, Tom. <laughs> yeah, just, I know Alexa has that. No, no, I wake up first in the house and I bring my wife coffee in the morning in bed every what? single day. So, so there's no excuse for grumpiness. <laughs> that's why that, that's why some of us are divorced, George. <laughs> we just did not yeah. figure that shit out. <laughs> well, this is 25 years too. So, yeah. you know, I finally came up with like, hey, you know, this works. If this is all it takes, okay. Um, let's see how many we got here. Yeah. We have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Teresa, have you gotten anything from um, from Department of Neighborhood Empowerment? They said they added you on there. Did you get anything about um, um, the about training. yeah the trainings? Yeah, I just got it today, but yeah. so I haven't opened it or anything. But. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm um, te technically you aren't allowed to vote. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm just a, because that, that's kind of the rule so that they have, um, but um, because you have to pass these trainings and sign the um, code of conduct. Um, it's not that the code of conduct, especially the, the other trainings will take a little bit of time, but um, if you could do that this weekend, that, that would be great. You know, um, this one, I was, you know, it takes them a little while to, to get this stuff out. I actually had to fight for weeks on the previous ones <laughs> to finally get it to them um, the the Friday before the meeting on Monday. So um, so at least they're, they're enough. 
Okay, let's see, who do we have? We have me, Aaron, that's two, Michael, three, uh, four for Tom, five, six, Jim, seven, eight, nine. We need one more. And we have some attendees with their hands up. Um, Gerilyn, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say, fuck Joe Buscaino. He's a piece of shit. I don't know why you guys invite I wish that guy would really tell us how he feels. Yeah, there's there's no um, room for that in there. Okay. Uh, Ricky or Richie? Yeah, I just also wanted to continue to say fucking Joe Buscaino saw. Okay. So that's a good sign. Um, okay. Uh, so just just to be clear, if 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 that's if this is something you want to say is is about some kinds of uh, obscenities, um, it's your right. But I'm not going to keep you in the meeting if you do that. Um, Stacy, go ahead. Hi. Um, how long do I have to speak, please? Uh, we'll be giving uh, people two minutes when 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 it's when we start the meeting. Okay. Great. Um, is it started yet? Or are you just um, no, not yet. We're 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 waiting for a quorum. We should be getting that pretty soon, though. Oh, okay. Hi. Well, I'm Stacy Dawson Stearns. I'm happy to okay. be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, and let's see. Okay. I think that's it. Um, let's see. Let's see how many we have. I think we have enough to for a quorum now. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, we have eleven. Aaron, you want to uh, run the vote or run the roll call? Yep. So I'm going to call this meeting. Uh, let me just call the meeting uh, to order. Uh, thank you guys for for coming out. I know it's another meeting, <laughs> like we all need another meeting, but I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, that being said, um, we have this one item. Hopefully, it doesn't take you know, more than four hours, um, but we'll see. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that being said, the case, uh, Eric, go ahead and uh, uh, call roll. Okay, Susan. Yeah, she said she would be late. Okay, Tom. Here, and I just got a text from Brandy. She's trying to reboot. Okay. Um, Sheila. Here. George. Here. Jim. Here. Luis. No, I think. Coyote. Uh, Margaret. Myself, Erin Brandy's on her way, so I'll hold up. M Matt. Here. Andrew. Here. Michael. Here. Buzia. Here. Awesome. Marshall, I don't think Marshall's here, right? No, I don't think so. Uh, Robert. He was on, yeah, he's on now. Okay. He's just, yeah. Maureen. No Maureen. Uh, tell yeah, Maureen said she couldn't make it. Okay. No. Bianca. Here, hello. Hello. Then Teresa. Yeah, she's here. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So that being the case, uh, the next item is, and we have just one item tonight. Just so everybody knows, uh, it's the discussion and possible motion to file a community impact statement regarding council file 21376, LA Alliance versus the city and county of Los Angeles, Martin versus the city of Boise, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Los Angeles Municipal Code. And there was, uh, the, I had the council file, an amendment. Uh, there's a council file that I had put up there, a motion, um, the amendment, and a substitute motion. Um, I tried to get uh, somebody from Bonin's office to speak to the substitute motion, 
um, but they said they don't come and um, to uh, neighborhood councils if they are uh, not in their areas. Um, uh, Stacy, did you have a question? I'm just in queue. It's typical for people to get into queue to make public comment at um, city council meetings. And okay, I that's fine. That's fine. Okay, I just wanted to make sure in case there were some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, and so, okay, so I'm assuming Caleb and Damon, uh, if you guys wanted to say something too, that you're part of that too. Um, we have Dennis Gleason. Dennis, I'm going to promote you to panelists. Dennis is a, um, a representative from the uh, uh, council member of Buscaino's office, and he agreed to present. Uh, and then we also, I just want to find out if there was somebody from the, uh, the what's it, the streets, not sweeps, what's the, what's the organization? Services, not sweeps. Services, um, services, not sweeps. Matt, did you, were you able to um, contact anybody? Um, so I, I did. I sent you an email um, just a few minutes ago, but oh, okay. um, there, there are two um, members that wanted to present together. Um, there is um, Robin and Ashley. Um, so I was told Ashley might see be a, a couple minutes I late. See, I see a Robin petering. Is that possibly? Yeah, that, that should okay. be that Robin. Okay, uh, so, very good. So yeah, so Ashley might be a couple minutes um, if uh, Boos Gaino's office wants to present first. Yes, well, I, I kind of think because it is their um, uh, motion uh, that they should sort of explain what it is because that's the uh, impetus, the genesis of us considering it. And so let me welcome Dennis Gleason. Dennis, thank you very much uh, for coming to tonight's meeting um, all the way from uh, your council district. My father is from San Pedro, was born and raised in San Pedro. So he's a member of that. He was a constituent of yours many, many, many years ago. Um, so uh, why don't you uh, introduce the, uh, what the motion is and what was behind it. And um, let's, uh, and, and give us your, the reasoning behind the council member's motion. And, uh, and then if there's any questions or clarifications that we can have that we want from uh, Dennis, we'll ask him. After that, we'll have the um, uh, uh, the other side, Rachel. What's her name? Uh, Robin. Uh, and then uh, and then we can have a comment from the public. We have some other comments that people have sent to us, and then we can uh, discuss amongst ourselves. And we can finally have a um, uh, make a motion as to whether we want to support it or not. And uh, and then hopefully we will have time to have dinner later this evening. Okay, George, Dennis. George, a second. George, did you say you yes. had uploaded these motions for us? The motions are on the website. Uh, there's a link on the website. On the, so if you go to tonight's meeting's agenda, there is a link of all the difference. The, there's several motions. So the first one is the uh, actual council file, which has everything there. But the second one is the motion. The third one is the amendment. And the fourth one is the substitute motion. Hey, okay, thanks. OK. Uh, Dennis, um, go ahead. All yours. Thank you for coming. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. President, honorable members, and Hollywood United stakeholders. I really appreciate the invitation to come and explain this. Um, we have received a lot of emails and letters about this over the week. I, I have met personally and my colleague Gabby Medina, who's also on the call um, and available to answer questions. Um, if I could ask that, that she be made a panelist as well. Um, yeah, we've, we've kind of, uh, we've found out there's a lot of misperceptions and, and so I really appreciate the time to address it this evening. I also wanna say thank you to all of you. You know, I recognize you're all volunteers I'm not getting paid at this minute, but this is my job. And I always appreciate the fact that, that we have residents that um, take their time in the evening hours after a long day, after you've all worked. I'm sure the last thing you wanna do is be in a government meeting. And uh, so I just wanted to say, I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing I wanna tell you guys too, is that I'm a Hollywood resident as well. I'm not in uh, Hollywood United area. I'm in the central Hollywood neighborhood council area. Um, but I am a Hollywood resident. I am an Angelino. And I tell you that because I want you to know that 
Um, this affects me too. And it, it affects me as a resident and I am subjected to the same policies and, and ordinances that, that the city council adopts. I don't get to run off to another city where we have different rules in place. And uh, I'll get to that later. Um, I also wanna express, I know, I get it. I, I can just sense the palpable kind of concern, the tension, that this is the issue that is at the top of everyone's mind. I take the red line to work every day. I'm still going into City Hall. I live it, I experience it every single day personally. Gabby and I go out to homeless encampments regularly, Gabby more so than I, but we were just at our major encampment in the district at Lamita and McCoy on Tuesday where we had a, uh, oh geez, that's just yesterday, where we had a, a homeless services day. Uh, we had uh, Lhasa there. We had our major outreach provider, Harbor Interfaith was there. We had legal services there through Inner City Law Center to help people take advantage of uh, existing uh, criminal charges that may be pending. And we also had needle exchange there. And I say that because the position of council member Busca, you know, in our office has always been all of the above. We have said yes to every single solution that has been suggested as a potential solution to homelessness or a mitigation measure to homelessness, uh, you know, Sharps boxes, uh, portable restrooms, showers, bridge housing, uh, rapid rehousing, master leasing, safe parking, uh, everything, all of the above has always been our approach. We are not enforcement first. We do not lead with enforcement. And uh, I want to make that very clear. The only solution to housing is home is is I'm sorry the only solution to homelessness is housing this is not a solution to homelessness this is an emergency mitigation measure to help us better deal with the crisis on our streets the same way as as sharps disposal boxes the same way as as uh as showers and restrooms doesn't solve homelessness it's just something that we need to do because there is a crisis out there on our streets um, so let me explain what the draft ordinance does. It repeals and replaces an outdated unconstitutional anti-camping law. That's Los Angeles Municipal Code section 4118D, which makes it a crime to sit, lie, or sleep on every street and every sidewalk in the entire city. That's what's on the books right now. So we are repealing and replacing that with a much more balanced and humane law that allows camping on nearly all sidewalks as long as there is a three foot pathway for pedestrians and clear areas around doorways and driveways. I'm gonna go through, we've kind of just pulled out the major questions. So this will kind of just be the, the FAQ that we've, we've prepared. And I can send to anyone who's interested if you'd, if you'd like this afterwards. Um, one of the major questions, does the draft ordinance criminalize homelessness? And the answer is no. The courts have struck down laws that criminalize the status of being homeless when they prohibit what they call life-sustaining activities, so things like sleeping and eating, or activities that are, quote, an unavoidable consequence of being human. I'm directly quoting from the Martin v. Boise decision, um, which uh, I'm sorry, uh, when you criminalize those activities or those unavoidable consequences of being human in all public areas, when no viable alternative is reasonably available. So the draft ordinance before the council actually decriminalizes homelessness. You can go take a look. The municipal code is available online. Our current version of LAMC 4118 makes it a crime to basically sleep anywhere on any street in the city. And so this replaces that citywide man with one that allows camping on nearly all 10,000 miles of sidewalks in the city. Another question, will the draft ordinance sweep or displace the homeless? No, I cannot be clear enough about this. Absolutely not. And if you don't take my, want to take my word for it or take the city council's word for it, take U.S. District Judge uh, David O. Carter's word for it. He said it in the last court hearing on the LA Alliance case. I don't have it right in front of me. I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, I'm not going to let the city enforce anything unless the housing is there. And I do want to repeat that. No one will be displaced or asked to move unless there is a viable housing alternative for them. And so what we're really talking about here 
what would go into effect immediately is the 36 inch pathway that is required by the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as a clear area of 10 feet on either side of a doorway or driveway. Um, another question, if the ordinance is adopted, does camping within 500 feet of a freeway immediately become illegal? And the answer is no. The ordinance establishes a process where after every unhoused person at a specific freeway encampment, I'm just gonna use Gower and 101 because um, I know that's in, in your guys' area, I believe. So the yeah. way it would work for that specific encampment, there would be two weeks of intensive outreach that would occur there. Same thing that happened in Councilman Blumenfield's district in CD3, where every single person in that geographic area would be offered housing. Uh, this is what Carter did in Orange County with the big Orange County global settlement is basically they would have what's called a, a day of decision where the there would be notices posted and there'd be this intensive outreach and only if every single person who is there is offered housing at that day of decision is when, uh, well, in Orange County, that's when the, the, uh, the ordinance, the anti-camping ordinances were allowed to be, um, uh, enforced. Here in Los Angeles, we would even have to take a second step. The city council would have to adopt a resolution that basically establishes that area as being off limits. And again, only after every person who is there is offered housing. No one gets displaced. No one is asked to move unless they're completely blocking the sidewalk and they're not allowing for that three foot path of travel or they're within the 10 foot dro doorway or, or uh, uh, driveway. Those are the only people who are gonna be asked to move anywhere unless there's housing available. And in that situation, they will only have to move to the, to the distance at which they're not blocking the sidewalk and they're not within that 10 feet of a, a doorway uh, or driveway. Um, same thing with the, the 500 foot provision around uh, homeless facilities, either storage facilities or bridge home or, or housing it would not immediately go into effect. Uh, when this ordinance passes, you're not gonna start seeing all these 23 radiuses around the city at our bridge housing immediately. What would happen would be an intensive two week outreach period. And then only after everyone is offered housing there would the council take step two, which is adopting that resolution. It would go through the full public comment process. It would, it would go through you know, the whole council process is normal. And at that point in time, we would establish that area as being off limits. Um, another question, what do other cities in LA County do? Like, do other cities have ordinances in place that criminalize homelessness? And the answer is yes. Every single city that borders the city of Los Angeles has an ordinance in place that criminalizes the status of being homeless. And when I say that, I mean they prevent either overnight RV parking, vehicle dwelling, personal property storage, or camping at all locations at all times. That's what it means to criminalize homelessness. When you, when you adopt a law that it is impossible for an unhoused person to comply with, as it is in West Hollywood, as it is in Beverly Hills, Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, Santa Monica, all of these cities, LA County, and, and Gabby can speak about that. This isn't just theory that this happens. The Sheriff's Department pushed an encampment across Lomita Boulevard into city of LA under threat of arrest. LA County currently has on their books right now a sit, light, sit lie sleep ordinance, an anti-camping ordinance that applies to every county street in unincorporated areas. Um, finally, is the city of LA prioritizing or leading with enforcement in its response to homelessness? And the answer is no. Over the past five years, we have done everything but enforcement. And I have the numbers on a, on a spreadsheet somewhere in my email. I don't know what exactly they are, but, but in terms of, of our existing 5611 ordinance, the only thing that's criminal conduct in there right now is, uh, is if you interfere with a sanitation employee in a cleanup. So the, it's not like the city has been leading with enforcement and that this has been our only response. It was, I'm not gonna lie about that. The city's primary response to homelessness for decades and decades and decades was to lock everyone up. And that's just not gonna work anymore, but that's not what we have been doing for the, the past five years. 
Um, we have uh, basically, if I could just go through this, we've constructed hundreds of units of permanent supportive housing. We've imposed a linkage fee on new development to pay for affordable housing, provided rental assistance, opened emergency shelters and recreation centers, housed thousands of our most vulnerable unhoused residents in hotels, and motels through Project Room Key. Room Key. We've deployed mobile showers, restrooms, hand washing stations, implemented trash pickup service at encampments and open safe parking lots. And going back to the ordinances, we have repealed two of our shameful anti uh, unconstitutional ordinances, which prohibited the storage of personal property in all public areas and prohibited vehicle dwelling on every city street. And again, we got rid of those off of our books, but look at all the surrounding cities. You know, we, we're not on a level playing field here. And so when, when we hear that the city of LA is criminalizing homelessness, I would like to ask what, what people are doing to contact these other cities because it is happening. And I'd like to turn it over to, to Gabby Medina. I mean, uh, she, she is on the ground. She's our district director. And she can tell you kind of what the, the real world problems are in our district that we are trying to solve. And, and just as a note, and welcome, Gabby. I'm glad you could make it as well. Um, just as a note, uh, it's not about your district, but it's about the entire city of Los Angeles. Okay. And this is why it's of concern to Hollywood, even though you are not uh, a representative of, of our district, but I appreciate the fact that you would still come out and talk to us because it is a big issue for our area. Gabby, go ahead. No, definitely. And I think that, you know, we have more things in common than we don't um, when it comes to all of our districts and our communities and the issues that we deal with when it comes to people experiencing homelessness. So I thank you for the opportunity for allowing the folks from the harbor to come out in and share a little bit about why we think that this is best for people that are experiencing homelessness, as well as the neighbors that are living next to them. Um, you know, we, we've definitely come a long way, like um, Dennis said, he and I have both worked for the city myself for eight years, I think Dennis over a decade now. So we've seen the progress that we've made and it has been thanks to the advocacy world. It has been thanks because of the legal world and individuals who made the, real, the, the city realize that criminalizing the homeless is not the answer. And council member Buscaino has seen that firsthand. Um, and we've worked with our service providers for over even beyond his term as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a council member. When he was a police officer, he worked with the nonprofits and realized outreach is best and housing is best. So that's what we all want. And we hope that every single council member meets that duty to build in their district so we can eventually get to a point where we're no longer talking about this issue. But what I did wanna say was, um, you know, this this policy is not criminalizing homeless homelessness. In fact, it's allowing people to be in areas where they will not be moved or disturbed, right? Um, so one example is the the shelters. Um, I I have three shelters in our district. So and I oversaw the outreach, um, the enrollment, and 300 people coming in. That's a lot of individuals moving into one facility, uh, being um, removed from a place where they were for many years at a time, some for even decades, and now into a facility where they have the support the resources and everything that they may need to get their lives back together. We cannot, and when I say this very loudly, we cannot get them out of an environment that has been bad for them and then put that environment back on the sidewalk right in front of their faces. That is temptation. That is almost, you know, telling an alcoholic, oh, you'll be fine and drinking right in front of him. We can't do that to people. You know, they go through a, a very different mental transition as they're getting off the streets and to see that lifestyle over and over again right outside of their facility it's beyond something. And I know this because I see it in our district and I've seen it everywhere else. Um, it's almost like working with human trafficking victims or domestic violence victims. We have to remove them entirely from that space and try to almost rebuild their mental health and their personal health so that they don't return back to the streets. Because as you all know, uh, the return rate is can be pretty high if they don't have that wraparound service and care. And so when we say 500 feet away from the shelter, that's not a lot of space if you think about it. There's 10,000 miles of sidewalk in the city of LA, 26 shelters that we've built, that's one example, uh, 500 feet, that's 13,000 feet. That equals 2.5 miles, let's say three miles. That means that people still have 12, uh, excuse me, 9,997 miles to sleep in. 
Yes, if we remove the freeway ones and the other shelter ones, there's still gonna be over 9,000 miles of sidewalk to sleep on. So how is that criminalizing? It's, it's very much the way that we are treating street vending which is a smaller population in our city and we're letting them know where they can where they can produce their income and where they can sell products so that they do not disrupt or dis disturb you know those around them whether it's the businesses or the ada um, needs that we need to meet for the rest of the population and that's all we're saying here these are sidewalks these are spaces for everyone and we all have to coexist business owners people that rent, people that, you know, that purchase, people that walk, people that visit and people that live. And this we feel is the, is the, the best middle ground that we can reach to and the best compromise where no one is displaced and everyone can, can, can work more cohesively until we find or until we build all of the, the housing that we need to get people obviously that second opportunity that they need. And, um, and that's all I wanted to say is just that when we speak about, you know, we're advocating for the homeless, um, are we really advocating or are we enabling situations? And if we really are advocating, we also wanna protect those that are removing themselves from those situations and making the decision to go into a shelter and wanting to get better. And how are we protecting them? Okay, thank you, thank you, Gabby. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dennis. So next we're gonna to go to uh, Rachel and Ashley. So uh, let's see, I see Rachel. I'm gonna bring you up, Rachel, or excuse me, Robin, excuse me. Um, and and is Ashley up there? I, I do not see, a oh, there you are, there's Ashley. Okay, so we have Rachel and Ashley. Um, okay, so I, or excuse me, Robin, actually, uh, Robin, forgive me for saying Rachel all the time. I'm sorry. I'm obviously I have a Rachel on my mind somewhere. Um, so, uh, so Robin, why don't you go first and then we'll get Ashley uh, and uh, you guys make your presentation. And then at that point, um, we're going to ask questions. Um, and what we'll do is we'll have questions for either the council member staff or for, or for you, you two. And then we will, um, once we do that, we'll open it up for public comment. And then we will have a discussion or comments from the board members, and then hopefully we can move on this, okay? So Robin, go ahead, it's your turn. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for having me and for inviting us to take some time to talk about uh, our position on this motion. I just, I'll introduce myself. My name is Dr. Robin Peterine. Um, I want to kind of share a little bit of my background too. I have been working in the field of homelessness and homelessness services um, for like over a decade. I started as a street outreach worker um, and then I have like moved throughout my career and like really with the goal of ending homelessness. Um, I currently, uh, my day job, what I really, I spend a lot of my time, my thinking and uh, like just a lot of effort on is thinking through solutions to ending homelessness, right? So that's like literally what I do. Um, I work with LASA. Uh, I work with different nonprofits across the county um, as well as across the state and uh, across the country. So this is something I think about a lot, right? And uh, a goal, I agree that all of us are here with the same goal to end homelessness, right? LA is in the, we have, the largest, like one of the largest, most pressing crises of unhoused. We have the most unsheltered uh, people in the country, right, in this city. Um, and all of you all can agree with that. Everyone feels that, sees that, experiences it every day. Um, so when we're talking about this draft ordinance or, you know, the motion that's at the table, um, we do see it is criminalization and enforcement as a tool, right, to ending homelessness. And and I, I hear that that maybe there are some stipulations, right, and uh, there are some, I uh, like you have to meet certain criteria to be able to enforce it. It might be around certain like a couple of blocks across um across the citywide, right? That it has limitations. I I hear that and see that those. Those are, that's the other side of the argument, right? But as, you know, sharing the goal of wanting to make a, make some sort of progress as we've been, we haven't been able to for a very long time, um, enforcement, criminalization, citations, pushing people around, moving people is absolutely not a tool. 
It is not something that we should be keeping in our toolbox. It has uh, no like evidence base um, and it, several different reasons, right? So um, we, I'm today representing the Services Not Sweeps Coalition, um, but as well as we went out and created a, I can share a letter um, that we've gotten signatures and sign-ons from 60 plus organizations that represent organizations across the city um, from ranging from like very small grassroots organizations to Everyone In, United Way, the LGBT Center, um, big organizations that are all again, sharing the same goal. Um, and the reasons why we're in opposition, uh, uh, just a blanket opposition of uh, criminalization and enforcement as, as a tool uh, or as something that can be used by people. Um, it has to do with several, first, I think the first thing to really note is it's a waste of resources is a big component of this, right? So actually interacting as we interact um, or use police um, or citations, the threat of arrest, all of those like kind of mandated uh, like compliance, uh, that, that doesn't actually solve the problem. And we might maybe have a temporary solution. We might be able to reduce the visibility of homelessness, but as someone um, is pushed around, right, they, uh, they risk losing uh, their important documents, right? Things that they may need uh, to get a job, to get into housing, to what about like a phone charger or things like all these like essential things that are necessary to move off the streets permanently, right? As well as I'm um, one really also really important thing uh, that that risks that's at risk our relationships and building rapport with street outreach workers, with case workers and things like that. Um, if you actually are committed to supporting a person and moving into permanent housing or long-term solutions, that requires a, a relationship, right? And a relationship requires consistency. That means that I'm a caseworker. I need to go down to the Gower underpass and make contact. I need to make consistent contact, um, contact that doesn't have the threat of uh, taking things away. And then that is where we're gonna see actual solutions and uh, maybe like get towards that goal in a way that uh, might is measurable and meaningful over a period of time. Um, I also just think that one thing that we really need to think about is the context of this is changing municipal code, right? And that has an, it, it might be something that could work or like that, I don't know, like you could meet the criteria and whatnot in different areas of town, like in San Pedro or in the Valley, but what works in San Pedro, this, this could have an impact across the city, right? Which is why we're talking here in Hollywood. And in Hollywood, the access to shelter is different. The number of unsheltered are different. It just, it has severe implications that we don't even know at this moment. Um, and also implications of if this does go forward of uh, lawsuits, um, kind of the per, like, process consequences that could come forward. Um, the other thing to, I'll try to keep it and have Ashley hop into the here is, you know, I think that we know, uh, it, it's also, I, I've heard a lot about how uh, presenting this motion is it, it's an incentive. It's kind of like getting, pushing people to that, that place maybe that they maybe weren't able to get to, like they're service resistant or um, a neighborhood doesn't want to shelter in their neighborhood, right? But criminalization shouldn't be an incentive or a way that we obtain those things, right? We should be building relationships with our neighbors, with our housed neighbors and our unhoused neighbors. We should have, be having real honest conversations rather than using, having like feeling the need that we need to have the threat of enforcement as a tool, right? That's just, it, that that doesn't make sense to me, right? If if that problem, these problems don't seem that hard that we need to go deep into changing municipal code to get the things that we all agree that we need, right? Which is more housing, more shelter availability, more resources, uh, and, you know, better outreach and all of those things that we severely lack. And I'm, uh, yeah, it, it, we know that like bringing 
bringing more services, bringing outreach. Uh, we can bring sanitation services, bathroom services, all those things to um, address the impacts of visible homelessness or encampments, um, even clearing ways on sidewalks. Those things can all be obtained with the proper, um, with the appropriate resources rather without, without a cop present, without those implications of threats and things like that. I'll stop right now and Ashley, do you wanna hop in? Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much, Robin, for all of that information. And thank you all for um, helping us facilitate this space tonight to have this discussion. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Ashley Bennett. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I'm one of the co-founders of Ground Game LA. Uh, and I have been working in the field of homeless services for a little over 10 years now. Uh, worked at the city level with LASA now um, and doing outreach through my own organization and also have lived experience myself. I kind of want to get just into the nitty gritty of all of this because you know, I keep hearing all of these arguments about this not being a criminalization measure. And as somebody who does work on the ground every day, reading this draft ordinance, it literally makes way for criminalization for our unhoused brothers and sisters who, does, who do not want to seek shelter. I don't know if everyone has read it, but there are literally stipulations in this draft ordinance that allow criminalization up to six months in jail and citations if people stay within these different realms. Um, so. I'm just tired of being at gaslit and told that this is not uh, a criminalization and a displacement measure. Um, for the Services Not Sweeps Coalition's point of view, this motion doesn't do anything for unhoused population. It's not going to decrease homelessness in Los Angeles. It doesn't provide for any new housing resources here in LA. It literally just moves people from one area to another. Like there is nothing in the draft ordinance that says anything about the actual units that are being built, where people are going to be taken into shelter. And as somebody who's trying to get folks into housing every single day in Hollywood, I know what the wait lists look like, especially here in CD13 and CD4. There are no shelter beds available right now. Also, you know, if we're talking about congregate shelters and, you know, housing for folks, we're still in a pandemic. And having people being offered congregate shelter access uh, is not something that the CDC would advise, especially with the stay-at-home measures that are in place. Um, and it's something that could be detrimental to our health and safety in this community. Um, with winter months approaching, this just doesn't seem lo logical by any way, shape, or form. Um, taking folks from under underpasses, one of the only natural resources that folks who are living outside have to seek shelter if they are living outdoors uh, is just going to expose them to the elements. As someone who has lost so many people from exposure who are unhoused, we've already experienced more than a thousand deaths in uh, the city of Los Angeles in 2020. Uh, that number is only going to increase if this goes through. Uh, it just seems very short-sighted and it doesn't get to the heart of the problem. What we need is housing. What we need is wraparound resources. What we need is more case management, we need more support, supportive services, we need to be commandeering hotels. Um, there's not one a one size fits all uh, solution for all the cases that we have out there. You know, we have so many un thousands of unhoused folks, especially here in Hollywood. Uh, and just saying that, you know, we can do this and move them into shelters and there's not going to be any criminalization involved. It's just, it's very short sighted and it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I feel like this this can't go through. Um, we have a lot of <laughs> we have a lot of other suggestions and things that we should be putting our time and effort towards. Um, we should be investing in getting to know our unhoused populations, and they should be at the forefront of this discussion. Like to be honest, right now, I, I'm disappointed that there are not more people with lived experience on this call. Why aren't we going and asking them what they would like to do about all of this? why they wouldn't be interested in going to congregate shelters at this point. Like this is a very top down kind of decision-making process and that's short-sighted because it's not gonna work out in the long run. It hasn't worked thus far. Um, that's very, that's evidenced by the thousands of people that we still have on the streets. So Services Not Sweeps Coalition, we completely want this motion to be struck. Um, we don't see any benefit to our community in it. Um, and we really want to encourage folks to focus efforts on providing motel rooms, commandeering them. Project Room Key didn't 
actually fulfill even, even a quarter of the rooms that were promised at the height of the pandemic. We need to end special enforcement, enforcement and cleaning zones, especially during a pandemic. You know, comprehensive cleanups that displace people on a week to week basis don't make any sense and put our communities at risk, unhoused and housed. We need to respect the CDC guidelines and work with health, our health department officials to ensure that basic sanitation needs are met. That's something that I think we can all agree on. Our encampments deserve to be clean, our unhoused neighbors deserve to have sanitation services, but not at the risk of being criminalized and displaced from where they're currently sheltering in place. Um, we need to remove law enforcement from this, this equation. And that's another element that's missing from this draft ordinance is how is this actually going to be carried out? You know, if something like this were to pass, have we actually brought our caseworkers and our outreach teams into the conversation and talked about how we're actually going to transport people in different districts to the shelter beds that are available? We have not. I can tell you that because I'm in contact with outreach workers from PATH, from LASA, and to them, this is also a criminalization and a displacement measure. So I just like everyone to take all of that into account. Um, would love to post, actually you can visit um, servicesnotsweeps.com and read our draft letter and kind of more uh, information about our stance on this. Um, but that's pretty much, that's what I have to say. Um, it's just, it's not productive in any way, shape or form in my opinion. Okay, thank you very much, actually. Appreciate it, appreciate all of these guys. All, all, all four of you for coming out uh, on a Wednesday night to a meeting uh, because we, we don't do enough Zoom meetings in our lives. Um, so the next, uh, uh, does anybody uh, on the board have any questions? And I, I really want to make sure it's not about making comments or um, uh, about, um, uh, you know, voicing your opinions. What it is is clarifications of either what um, uh, the services not streets organization or uh, council member Buscaino's staff have to say, uh, because we will get into the, the next level. But before we start talking and making our opinions known, I think we need to hear from stakeholders. And we have currently uh, uh, seven uh, attendees with their, with, uh, with their hands up. By the way, we have 53 people on this uh, meeting tonight. So I think that's uh, pretty impressive, uh, and, which means that a majority are not on the board, which is a big deal. Uh, okay, so we have four panelists who have their hands up. We have Matt and Brandy, Robert, Fuzia, Sheila, and Michael who have questions. Uh, Matt, why don't you ask your question? Thanks, George. Um, I have a few questions for um, the Buscaino reps, um, whoever would like to take the questions. So, um, first question was, you mentioned there was an unconstitutional uh, city law that this would be replacing. Is that current law still being enforced right now? It is being enforced um, for ADA in some circumstances because we don't have any other tool on the books. But if you go and look at it, there's, you know, there's two little italicized case laws that's underneath it. It, in, it includes the words uh, annoy and molest, with the, which the courts have, have ruled are, are unconstitutionally vague. Um, so in some circumstances, but for the most part, uh, no, it's not. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Uh, my second question, um, uh, Gabby mentioned that there's, would be under this mo motion, um, over 9,000 miles of sidewalks that were not uh, forbidden for sitting or sleeping. Does that include residential areas would be permitted to sleep under this ordinance? Correct. There's no differentiation between uh, zoning. It's really about the size of the sidewalk and making sure that there's room for a wheelchair to pass. And then also um, just, just keeping a little zone around a little free area around doorways and driveways. So potentially would people who were like asked to leave uh, areas around and, uh, shelters and underpasses and uh, building entrances, they would be allowed to sleep on like move, move into neighborhoods like on neighborhood sidewalk. Well, there well no one's going to be moved from an encampment without being offered housing. Um, that that's, you know, I, I have the transcript I can send you from the court hearing. Again, if you don't trust us, we have the eyes of a federal judge on us right now. And so 
Um, no one is going to be dispersed from a freeway uh, overpass underpass without being offered housing. So I, yeah, I, I didn't see that. I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, Matt, and technically, um, currently, right now, people could technically camp out in a residential community. It's just that many individuals choose okay. not to because of the high visibility. Okay. So it's a personal choice, not a legal choice. I appreciate that. And you mentioned the um, the two weeks of intensive outreach and and that program, but I don't see that in the actual motion. So is there like a mechanism that the city council will have to make sure that that will actually happen? I'm glad you brought that up and it makes me really happy that you have read the ordinance because um, you're absolutely correct. It doesn't stay it in there. And, you know, this is how these work. The, the council kind of gives the city attorney general direction. This is what we want to see in an ordinance. And that was everyone's intention. That's kind of the model that worked in Orange County. It's the model we're trying to copy here in Los Angeles County and the city of LA working with Judge Carter. But you are right, it is not in the ordinance. And so I would encourage the neighborhood council tonight, you know, you guys have the opportunity to take um, community impact statements, I think for or against, but you can also say uh, against unless amended, I believe you have you have some some ability. And so I would encourage you, you know, if that is something that you want to see written in the draft ordinance, um, you know, communicate that. Let, let us know, hey, you know, we would be fine, but we don't see anything in here that specifically states um, in subsection B or C, that's the, the uh, shelters in the freeways radius provision. Um, but. The other thing, I, I had a conversation with the city attorney's office. My understanding from them is that they were going to be transmitting a, another draft ordinance to kind of put a little bit more clarity. And I don't know exactly what they're going to say, but I think it would be something along the lines of requiring the council to adopt findings that there was this intensive outreach or that everyone at that specific location uh, was offered housing. Um, but but yes, you are correct. As the, the draft of the ordinance is written right now, it doesn't specifically state that. I think it may in the cover letter, um, but, but the intention when we did this, we're, 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 we're trying to mimic a process that was successful in Orange County, move 3,500 people into housing without a single arrest as Councilman Vaughn and substitute motion correctly states. And, uh, and, and so that's what we're trying to, to do here. No one is going to be just moved from a freeway. I know that Carter's initial preliminary injunction kind of created a lot of confusion about that. I want to be clear, he vacated that, that preliminary injunction. It is not in place now. Um, but from his perspective, I'm just repeating his public comments he's made in court proceedings. The reason why he's focused on um, freeways are, number one, uh, Caltrans sent a letter to the city that basically said we can't put a pallet, uh, little, uh, sorry, tiny house village at a Caltrans owned lot by the, the 110 freeway downtown because it's unsafe for people. Um, and, and also he mentioned in the last hearing that I think the third leading cause of death um, from uh, a preventable cause of death for the unhoused is um, being struck by vehicles. So I'm just repeating what he said. I, I think that's why he's focused on on freeways. Um, and and that's kind of why it came into the conversation. But I do want to be clear, there is no injunction in place where the city is not being forced to remove everyone from from freeways. Okay. So in okay. Matt, that, OK, just OK. Wait. OK, yeah, I just want to make sure that we, we get everybody get their chance. Yeah. I, yeah, it's just in addition to the freeways and 500 feet of shelters, it's also 10 feet from any entrance, driveway, or uh, building, anything like that. It seems like that would be significantly more expansive than just, uh, and it, I, I would be concerned that Bruce Guy News Office has the ability to offer housing to every single person within 10 feet of a building entrance. Um, but I, I just, if, I, if I'm short of time, I just wanna have one more question. So let's say I had bad breath and let's say the city didn't want me and my bad breath within 500 feet of any store that sells breath mints, even if they're closed. Would you say, um, Dennis or Gabby, that the city has criminalized my bad breath? I, that, I'm sorry, that, I lost that, your you know what, train you know, of logic. I, 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 I had a point I that you're trying to make. And I think you uh, lost it too. 
I, I look. I, I think this is uh, this is. We can leave that to your time to um, for comment, Matt. But if you have any specific questions about um, the the ordinance or anything like similar to what you had before, do you have anything more than that, or should we move on to to the others? I, I guess I'll just go back to what I was asking earlier about the ten foot. Like, it is would this does the office have the ability to produce a map? Um, or to give a, like a number percentage uh, of the amount of city that would be available, including these other provisions such as uh, uh, building entrances and driveways? Uh, we don't have the ability to produce that map. I'm sure we could probably get Bureau of Engineering's GIS division to, to try. Um, this is a little wonky, boring thing. We finally started mapping out our sidewalks for a long time, we didn't even know where they were, how wide they are, where there's parkways. I don't know how far along the Bureau is coming in that, but that was part of settling the Willits ADA class action lawsuit that requires us to, to fix our sidewalks. So I, I can't answer that question. We are in the process. I know it sounds bizarre that a city of 4 million people wouldn't know how wide its sidewalks are, or even where they're at, but we are starting that process. I, I don't know if they have finished mapping everything yet. Okay, Matt, is that enough or do you have any more questions? That's and let me just add, if you think 10 feet is too much, you know, I would encourage you guys um, through your, your um, community impact statement to say, if you think it should be five, if you think it should be two, you know, we want to have a, an open dialogue and we're really looking for suggestions in terms of what limitations this is what the city does. We regulate time, manner, and place. And you know, to your, your point, I think what you were getting at, I would say that this ordinance criminalizes homelessness no more than a red curb criminalizes driving. It's, it's, it doesn't mean you can't drive or park. It just means in specific locations. And that's what we're trying to do here is just strike a balance between the, the rights of the unhoused and the rights of the public at large for accessible and clean public spaces. Okay, Matt, I'm, I'm gonna... I'm going to go on to Gabby, unless you have something else. No, I was going to say it does vary because we 40% of our district is industrial. So that means that we have container trucks, 3,000 of them coming in and out of our communities daily, right? We have the Port of LA adjacent to us. So 10 feet is probably not enough for some of our trucks to get in and out. Uh, just on Lomita the other day, I, I saw a big rig turn. He was literally inches away from the encampment. That's not safe for the driver. That's not safe for the person living on the street. So maybe it varies by planning and zoning. That's also a conversation that we can have. Okay, thank you, Gabby. Okay, let's move on to uh, Brandy. You have, uh, go ahead and um, ask your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. So will you only be off, so say like for example, in our neighborhood, we've got, I think four or five encampments. Would you only be doing this process if all five encampments have significant enough um, housing or do you do make a determination encampment by encampment so the um, only, th sorry, I am. No, sorry, I just want to, I'm just trying to figure out how you're making a decision, which, in, which encampments you're going to to offer housing and whether or not that generates its own discrimination as to who gets priority over another group. Um, so the, the first thing is that, that none of the provisions that relate to the, the buffer zones, the freeways or the, um, or the, the, shelters or or even subsection D, which would establish kind of citywide a principle that you basically, if there's a bed available that that you should take it and and that you can't camp on the, the sidewalk. So the only provision that's in, in place immediately is the ADA, the three feet and the doorways and driveways. And so in terms of, of when to prioritize, what we're working for with the Carter settlement is each council district, based upon their latest homeless count results, has a target of beds that we have to provide. And we're doing it in CD15 through Project Home Key. We purchased a motel. We've got um, three bridge home facilities. We've got a tiny house village that we're putting in. So nothing would be enforced until we get to that point. And even once we get to that point, if you look at the Orange County settlement, I have a copy. I can send it to anyone who's interested. Orange County is still hemmed in by that. Even, even once we get to that point, you're still gonna have to offer someone a shelter. It doesn't mean, oh, we've reached 60%, now we can just you know, enforce left and right. We're still conditioned upon there being uh, an available shelter bed. 
Okay, Randy, do you have, do you, uh, go ahead. Do you have any more questions? Two more questions. So okay. if someone refuses housing, how do you track them? And does that does that um, take them out of the running for housing later down the down the line? Absolutely mm -hmm. not. It's everyone is tracked through the coordinated entry system. It's a nationally based um, system that's used by outreach workers all over the nation. Um, every single time an outreach worker through the county, whether it's LAFA, Hopix, PATH, Harbor Interfaith makes contact, they can go into the HMIS system and see where this person first made contact with an outreach worker, where they've been, uh, what shelters they've been at, or when they were offered housing, all of that. We understand that people are not gonna say yes off the, you know, immediately when they're offered housing. And not every housing option is gonna be suitable for them. Um, however, at some point, we need to have a more serious conversation about, you know, if someone has been offered housing five times, um, you know, what there's there's a there's a deeper problem there that we need to assess that we need to possibly bring in other type of social services to address. Can I add something about the coordinated entry system and housing allocation? Just want to like throw this out here there too, because again, this is something that I spend my day job doing lots of stuff on thinking through. So the coordinated entry system, we've decided like to have this giant system to allocate resources and housing based on best fit and highest like vulnerabilities. So we have this citywide, countywide system that's been in place for a really long time that actually distributes housing in an equitable way. And the city just threw like $150 million to even make that system more equitable, right? And this, actually this municipal code and this Judge Carter, all this thing is just like throwing it all out the window. Cause we know, um, which is really a huge problem for us people that are like focusing on effectiveness of systems and uh, again, like ending the solution. So that's something that I'm really worried about and something that we deal with like every day of like, how is this freeway ordinance gonna mess up this community queue in allocating all of our resources that we, again, do not have enough of. Right, so making sure that people get the appropriate resources in an effective manner is really what we should be focusing on. And this code like really puts a lot of risk to that. That this really wonky and technical and I can talk about that at another time, but really wanted to add it there. My last hey, thank question, you, Robin. my last Go question, ahead. does the city have a liability for the potential uh, respiratory illnesses, uh, car accident deaths, et cetera, by keeping um, uh, people under the freeways? Cultures. That's that's a, a a bit of a legal question. It's it's hard to say. I mean, I that we have an ongoing lawsuit right now. The LA Alliance case has several claims. ADA is one of them. Um, you know, property owners are arguing inverse condemnation. Another issue that that is happening is some property owners can't get fire insurance because fire hydrants are blocked because the conditions on the the the. Um, the sidewalk are so dangerous. So, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer. I love reading laws. I, you know, I, I've read all the court decisions, but I can't really say what the city's liability might be in, in, in that um, situation or on that, on that issue. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, are, are you, are you done? Done. I'm okay. done. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Robert, it's your, your choice, your chance. Thank you, George. Um, so because the, the this ordinance kind of rests on the ability to offer people housing, I just have a couple of questions about the availability of housing um, in the city. You know, per the Los Angeles, per the homeless count earlier this year, uh, we had 12,400 or so um, sheltered people, 28,800 unsheltered people, totaling 41,000 people in the city, right? So my question is, um, I have a few that are just related to the uh, availability of housing. How many shelter beds or interim housing uh, beds exist in the city right now? And that question's either for the for anybody that was speaking to us. Do you know how many shelter beds we have now? We actually don't have a good system that tracks shelter beds. At the last shelter inventory, we have it was fifteen thousand shelter beds across the city. Mm -hmm. um, additional beds on board. Um, yeah. so currently entered into agreement with Hakla to purchase 15 motels throughout the city of Los Angeles and additional hotels purchased through the county. So there's new beds coming on board, I would say on a monthly basis. By the end of this year, we will have added a couple hundred more 
close to a thousand. And on top of that, we have um, other forms of, of shelter coming on board, whether it's safe parking, uh, the pallet shelter, and it all kind of varies. But like Robin did say, we we do need, and that's something that the council member has been advocating for, is um, for LASA to develop a way by which we can track how many beds are available at that moment at that time uh, to be able to determine that. Yeah, so right now we have 15, we have roughly 15,000 is what I'm hearing. And you're estimating a couple hundred are coming on in the next the next year? She said- And that's, uh, and that's almost... not accurate. May, may I just jump in really quickly here? Um, just because as somebody who's doing work on the ground and trying to get people into housing every single day, the only system that we have available to us right now is obviously HMIS and um, coordinated entry system like we can send messages to each other but honestly the only way to really get somebody into a shelter bed is to make calls to the specific shelters every single morning and see if there's any beds that have opened up so right now I can say in Hollywood we do not have any beds available Thank okay you. so um, but, 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 but the, but the total, sorry George right, the, so, so the, okay so the total his, his question is uh, we have 15,000 and what Gabby said was we have close to another thousand coming online uh, towards the end by the end of this year. Is that correct, Gabby? Correct. And yeah. I did also agree with um, who was it? It was Robin and with you, Sheila. Um, I don't know if you thought that I disagreed with you, but I said I agree with you that we do not have a method by which we track beds that are available that specific day. Okay, Thanks. so that was it was with Ashley, just for clarification with Ashley. Okay, so Ashley and Robert. So Thanks. go ahead, Robert. Yep, how many permanent housing units for uh, homeless, uh, for people who are homeless are coming online in the next year in the city? Anybody have that number? Um, it's on HHH, um, but let me look. I know, I just know the ones for our district, but not the citywide ones. Okay, it's on wow. the HHH website though, it tracks it. How many are in the pipeline? How many will be available um, within the next 18 months? And so on and so on and so on. I think the overall HHH was supposed to build 10,000 units, but they're not going to nearly hit that goal at all. So the, it's already a, like a little shy of the 10,000. I yeah. think it's going to be, my, my data indicates it's going to be somewhere around 7,000 units total. Is that yeah, how? and that's over like the next. And that's not the next year, that's over the next 10 years. Yeah. So it's yeah. not, again, we have. 60,000 people that are sleep or like sleeping unsheltered, not including the ones that have fallen right. into The key this. word is, the conversation today is not about the units, it's about people will not be moved unless a unit is offered. So okay. unless the unit is offered yeah, to right. them, they're not going to be moved. They're not right, going I understand. to be offered yeah. housing. I'm, I'm just kind of evaluating in my head the cost effectiveness of trying even creating this ordinance if we don't have enough housing to offer people. My next question is, uh, what is the average wait time to enter one of the, the city funded shelters? It depends by district because this, the bridge home shelters were intended Citywide. to support um, people experiencing homelessness within that immediate community. So depending on what community you live in and how many beds are available, um, it just, it varies. Like, like I believe, I'm not sure who mentioned that here in Hollywood, um, you don't have any beds available. Well, that's different because in Wilmington, we do have beds available. So it mm -hmm. just varies. So if we have HMIS and it's all the data about when people are offered housing, you know, if I raise my hand today, I'm homeless, I want a shelter, how long is it going to take me to get a shelter? It could take up it, to 90 days sometimes. <laughs> no, way longer than that. Uh, so there are some folks that I have been working with personally at Gower 101 who have been trying to get into housing and who have been on the wait list for several different shelters, not just in CD13, but outside of CD13 as well. And they it's been well over six months that six months to a year, I'd say that they've been on wait lists. So somewhere between three months and a year, would that be yep. a fair? Yeah. Is that, Gabriella, is that fine? Well, in my district is different. Like I said, it varies by district and it's based on the number of solutions going up in each community. And it also varies uh, in terms of how many beds are being made available. So for example, um, the project home key, it's probably in every single district with the exception of a few. And there's gonna be, um, each of them has between 40 and hundred beds available. And those will be made available within the next, by January. So it just varies. I want to add too right now that um, you only really get housing if you're COVID vulnerable as well. Got okay. It. So uh, Robert, do you have anything more? Two quick ones, George, and then I'm done. Okay. 
Um, so then, as you mentioned, there was a target number of beds that would have to be created to even start enforcing that. What's this to target number? Uh, it's 60% of the 2020 homeless, is it 2020, Gabby? I think it's 60, for each council district, it's basically 60% of their 2020 count numbers. I apologize, I don't have those in front of me, but we do have them available. Wait, so would I... it be correct to estimate 60% of the total unsheltered population would be close to the number? Uh, yeah, it's just broken up by council district. But yeah, if you want to look at the citywide number, then then that's the the target that that we have to reach. But I think the one thing this judge recognizes is that LA is just a it's a huge beast. You know, we're talking about Hollywood and what to do in in Hollywood when in in Wilmington we have beds available, and that's what makes this very difficult. So what what Carter is trying to do is to break the city up into the individual council districts and then kind of set a target for each district. And so some districts may be able to start enforcing once they reach their, their targets, but that will be up to the, the federal judge in this case. I understand, so 60% so of the total over the city, if we use 28,000 unsheltered, we'd be looking at a target of 16,800 roughly. Does that sound right? That sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, okay. but it's but it goes but it's district by district. It's district by district. You're separate breaking it up. I understand. I'm just looking at the big numbers. So there's 952 unsheltered in the 2020 count, council district four. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I think that covers it. I, so, so we've got 28,000 people who are homeless. We've got 15,000 beds. We're going to get to 16,000, and we want to add 16,000 more before we could enforce this citywide. I didn't jot your numbers down, but but sixty percent is is the target, correct? I don't have any. I, I do have those on a on a spreadsheet, and I think it was submitted to the court in the, the city's last um, status update. Okay, uh, I appreciate let's, let, let let's go on to Fuzia. Go ahead, Fuzia. Thank you. Um, so I have three quick questions. Uh, hopefully, quick question. Uh, now, when shelter is offered to the uh, unhoused uh, population, uh, is there an effort made for them to uh, stay in the area they are used to? Or can they be displaced very, very far away? In other words, can it be a reason for them to refuse to go? And if they refuse to go, uh, are they removed for Every individual that it's um, identified within that spa, um, the service provider makes every attempt to keep them within that spa. There are special circumstances, whether it's domestic violence or re family reunification that may be an ex um, may, that may exempt that rule. But overall, the rule is where that individual is found, where they've been homeless the most, um, they will try to find them permanent housing within that community so as to not displace them. Okay, and uh, in, in, in for the motion that we are discussing tonight, um, I understand that nobody will be removed forcefully um, uh, before being offered housing, right? Now, what happens if somebody doesn't refuse the housing? Are they automatically on the list of people that will be removed forcefully or is there, how, how do you see that situation, uh, you know, being there? Um, certainly, what we hope happens is exactly what happened in Orange County, that we're able to move like they did in OC, like Councilman Bonin's substitute motion correctly states 3,500 people into housing without a single arrest. And something that, that you know, the some of the OC outreach workers we've talked to, the, the folks that were helping Councilman um, uh, Blumenfield in, in Council District 3, is that, you know, unless you have a deadline, um, oftentimes, you know, people will, will put it off. And we all do that. I do that myself. Uh, the, the city de departments do that. If we ask for a report, we don't give them a deadline, then it just it, it lingers and lingers. And so what they did in Orange County is they would do two weeks of outreach and they would put notices up and say, you know, this is, I think as Carter called it, the, the decision day or day of choice or something, which is pretty much you have two weeks and they, they come every day and, and offer housing. But you know, once this date comes, you're going to have to leave this area. And if you refuse to leave that area, then that's when you would be um, sub subject to an enforcement action. Um, something I want to uh, point out as well is that 
it specifically states in this ordinance that violations would be eligible for a prosecutorial diversion program. And what that means, it's, it's something our former neighborhood prosecutor um, was really successful at doing in the Harbor area where, you know, someone would get in, not even one of these ordinances, she would get a case sent to her to file for um, a drunken public or something. And she would often work out and say, hey, I will drop these charges if you agree to go into a treatment program. And so I just want to state that as, as well, that, that the objective here is not to put anyone in jail. We sincerely do not want a single person to get arrested. And we, we, we want to copy what works successfully in Orange County, 3,500 people into housing without a single arrest. Mm -hmm. And last question, in worst case scenario, for the motion that we are discussing tonight, worst case scenario, uh, let's say that there are people who refuse to go there. Everything that you explain, and I, and I, and, and, and I you know, it, it makes sense to me. But let's just say for those where all of that fails, what are they facing? Does that mean that uh, police comes, arrest them, put them in jail, and they are prosecuted? Like, what is... What is the situation for those possible people that are going to be left out at the end of the process? What is what are they facing? This is I just want to say like the reality of what I've seen in my communities with with my police officers. I don't know a single police officer who wants to spend eight hours booking someone who is unsheltered simply to have them there for only 24 hours and then they have to come back out and they're going to be doing the same activity that they were doing that you arrested them for. It doesn't make sense to arrest them. It's something in the books to have leverage, but at the end of the day, all of us here should be hopeful and should be focusing on what can we do to get this person to say yes. When one of my outreach workers is not successful, you know what we do? We send another one. When they're not successful, we send another team. When they're not successful, we send the church and the pastor. When they're not successful, we send another organization. Whoever it takes to make a connection with someone, to get them to say, I will consider housing, not I will stay in housing, I will give it 30 days. And that's how literally we got many people to move into our bridge homes with the condition of 30 days and now they've been there for months. So I would love to hear from advocates instead of focusing on what would, could go wrong, let's try to put every measure in there so that we have the resources to get people to say yes for a second opportunity at life. I just wanna, uh, that the way that the city attorney has written it right now, there is, it does say that someone can be arrested and go to jail. I understand that he might be coming back with a revision, but that's written in there, right? And I just don't think, you know, we can talk about like scenarios that maybe we've seen witness with one cop or one police officer that's happened one way, but to change our code that would actually have this as an option is just, it's so problematic for like reasons, I, I can't even like get as deep into this as I'd like to, because I want to respect everyone's time, but like the slippery slope and just to have this as an option is just, is a huge risk and detriment to our city. And I also, also want to add that Los Angeles is not Orange County and continuing to bring that back in here as a comparison, it is really, um, is it fair thinking right now? Um, isn't just a second. So maybe, okay. uh, a good homework assignment would be what other, instead of that, what else can we have to get people that would encourage people to get into housing? Yeah, and those are great okay. questions to ask. And again, want to uplift Ashley, what she said in the beginning is talking to the people that are unhoused and um, that are not, uh, you know, not choosing the shelters that might be offered for whatever reasons and bring them into the solutions and the conversations. Um, okay, so I, I really want to keep this uh, focused on the questions because we've got other things and then and then we can, uh, because we've heard from everybody and I, and I don't want this to be prolonged, but and I want to appreciate everybody's time. So Aaron, you have a question. Go ahead, Aaron. And then we have Sheila, then Michael and Bianca. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I just want to really clarify that shelter beds are considered housing in this ordinance because shelter beds I mean, I would not hop into a shelter bed. I've worked with the unhoused community for years. I know women that absolutely will not hop into a shelter. It's dangerous. They get their stuff stolen. They get assaulted. 
I had a homeless couple I had live with me for a few months to get them off the street. They were married and he was a, a war vet. They would separate married couples in certain shelters. They did not want to be separated. So I don't think this should be considered housing. Is it a shelter bed really considered housing? Um, so I would, I would answer, you know, to, to your point, Gabby and I experienced this about two years ago. When was Watts opening, Gabby? I think it was about two years ago we went out there and we were, yeah, one of the biggest hurdles that, that we found when we were talking to people is that, that kind of impression of a, a shelter. There's connotations that it's not safe, that, that you have to be sober to go in, that you have to agree to some religious instruction or something, that you can't bring your pet in. So I just wanna say, and, and I can't speak for every shelter, but I can speak for the city's uh, a bridge home shelter. We don't separate couples. You can go in, there's men's side and woman's side. They don't live in the same setting. Um, you, if you have a pet, you can bring your pet in. And, um, as long as they're kept in a, in a crate, again, it is a congregate setting and they're kept in a, it, they have to be kept in a crate, but there's a, a pet area available. And the other most in, important one too, is that we don't make people become sober. And there's actually these things, they call them amnesty boxes. You know, we can't, because of liability, all this other stuff with federal law and controlled substances act, we can't kind of allow people to bring stuff in, but we do have a, uh, it's called an amnesty box where anyone who has illegal drugs or paraphernalia can keep it locked up there. And there is no, you know, there, there's no risk of, of criminal prosecution. So I do understand that that is a, a concern that's out there, but you know, to what, I heard someone mention earlier, people are dying on the street. So we really have to ask ourselves if there is an indoor bed available. Yeah, it may not be perfect, but at least it has fire life safety. It has a sprinkler system. It has had a building inspector make sure it's not going to fall down and kill you in an earthquake. I mean, it has restrooms and showers and, and running water. So I, I really think we need to, to look at you know, yeah, a, a, a congregate shelter is not ideal, but but it is much more ideal than the conditions out on the street. And it's and it's part of a transition. Remember that um, I understand that it can be easy to say that that is not an ideal setting for you or for myself, but it's all about a matter of choice. These individuals, many are ready to go into their own apartment. Some are ready to go into possibly a shelter, you know, just for women. Others will want to go into a motel. It's a matter of choice, you know, and, and we don't, and we can't say that some people won't want to do this because 2,000 people did this and there's 2,000 people currently happy. And someone said it right now, the ABH in Hollywood, it's at capacity because guess what? It was suitable for all those individuals and they're there and they like it and they're staying there. It was suitable for the 250 people that came into my shelter and we're currently working on getting the other 50 in. So although it might not be to our level of standards for housing, we have different levels of housing and homelessness housing has to be that. You have to have different categories and different levels of it because not everyone is going to be ready to go into something permanent supportive immediately off the streets. Some of them have to transition it out. I want to add that the ABH shelters, right, the uh, bridge home shelters, they were created as bridge housing, right, and meant to be like that bridge, right? We agree that 30 to 90 days temporary as you're waiting and moving to a long, uh, longer, well, that's what they were intended to no, be. They were not. No, they were not. They were intended until permanent supportive housing came on board. And so my, my residents, our residents have been there for up to a year now in Watts. And yeah, and that's, months. that's common now, but that's the common. Original... So intended to be bridge housing, bridge housing, okay. in my okay. understanding as is 30 to 90 days waiting for your permanent shelter. So the throughput was really important. People have been there for up to two years now, right? So they're full and at capacity because there's nothing on the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Erin, did you have anything more? No, I, I just don't think it should be taken lightly that uh, married couples do get separated. Even if, yeah, it looks ideal, I'm off the street, but you're without any support. You're without the, your lifeline. So it's, it's a very, I think we need to look at inside these shelters, the experiences in there, and they do get robbed. That has nothing to do with the amnesty box. They get their stuff stolen. So I think that needs to be discussed a bit more. Okay. Well, let's let's get on to the other questions because we also have all the um, uh, attendees who are have questions too. Okay. So, um, uh, Sheila, go ahead. 
Um, a question for the group that I think it was ground game and um, services not sweeps. What do you, how do you intend to accommodate in the current situation, the disabled, the elderly, the families that are trying to use sidewalks and are now being pushed onto the streets or the fact that they're being chased by some of the home, there's some criminal activity going on and no enforcement of that criminal activity. I don't hear any solutions provided by your organizations in dealing with those. They're just as you know a valuable portion of our population as the homeless. Yet they don't seem to, they don't, they're at least talking to us and saying, how come we don't have the right to use the sidewalk anymore? It's not wide enough. And this particular, you know, motion is, is allowing for that, that three foot uh, width to be dedicated back to pedestrians. Robin or Ashley? Uh, we believe that outreach workers and sanitation and things like that could assist with uh, clearing ADA clearance um, and also cleaning streets. We believe that encampments need uh, sanitation services, trash cans. They don't get trash services. They uh, rarely get restrooms and running water and things like that. Um, again, we, we agree that sidewalks uh, should be maintained, um, but we don't believe through enforcement and criminalization and uh, law enforcement is necessarily the right way to do it. And uh, the best use of our resources. Ashley, do you want to add? Yeah, it's all about education. And I think that we are in agreement that, you know, we want to have our sidewalks be accessible. We want our streets to be um, clean for both our unhoused and housed neighbors. Like that's, I feel like that's a basic human right. Um, we actually do have a pilot program that's coming out now that's already taking place in Venice and is going to be taking place here in Hollywood um, where folks from the unhoused community are actually going to be going out and educating their fellow unhoused um, communities about these ADA rules and actually taking time to clean up each encampment um, you know, on a weekly basis um, that's less intensive than the Care and Care Plus program. So that's that's what we have coming down the pipeline right now. So we are absolutely working on um, alternative solutions to city enforcement and having police being be involved and having our unhoused brothers and sisters be at the forefront of that discussion. So to say that like we don't have a solution to that, like we are working towards that. Uh, our pilot program should be here in Hollywood. Uh, we're hoping to start that at the first week of December. December. Well, I mean, uh, from my understanding, okay, so, wait, this is, and this is continuation. Everybody else got three questions. I, yeah, like no, no, I, I just want to make sure that you got the next question, Sheila. Um, uh, the fact is, is the trash that m many of the homeless are containing in their area are bulky items that they picked up from other people that were destined for sanitation to pick up. And now they're claiming it's their possession so that they can't get it picked up. So, and you know, you're saying, yeah, sanitation is cleaned up Gower encampment once a, a month or maybe every other week. Immediately afterwards, they come back and they take over the sidewalk again. We don't have a city that will ever have the enough money to continuously clean up after these encampments so that pedestrians can legally use the sidewalks or families can walk their children to school. So I mean, you're stating something, but this has all been done and it's not happening for these people. Okay, so do you have a question? Yeah, it's like, how, how is it that we can limit the, the amount of possessions that they have so that the sidewalks are free and clear? I mean, there was the 60 gallon, you know, that was shot down. And is there something that you're working on to, to help actually mitigate some of the trash that's now on the sidewalks? I think trash in sanitation, cleanup and pickup is very different than personal possessions. Like I don't wanna make any comments or statements on taking anyone's personal belongings. Yes, making sidewalks ADA accessible, I think is important, but um, I don't really wanna comment on, you know, taking people's belongings if they're trying to, you know, shelter in place and make their selves at home um, outdoors. Uh, so, let me, I just want to give a little context. When we wrote 5611, we established that 60 gallon rule. We kind of have it had a decision point. Um, we looked at what Chicago did in a lawsuit settlement where they agreed um, on Lower Wacker Drive, they would only pick up uh, or they, they set aside certain items that constituted essential personal property, uh, sleeping bag, bedroll, eyeglasses, medication, documents, photographs. 
we talked to our sanitation employees and, and at the time they said, we don't really want to be in this business of, of determining, you know, what's what we, we would rather just kind of establish a quantity and then say to people, whatever you want to keep, that's fine. But, but there's a limit to the quantity. And so I, I would just, yeah, it's, it's a real issue that we're trying to address here. Should there be any limits? Um, you know, other people have suggested instead of doing a, a volume-based quantity, which really isn't being enforced now, but maybe it's a, it's a square footage. Uh, maybe it's a, everyone gets a, a 10 by 10. And, and, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if not these limits, then, then what should the limits be? And if we don't have limits, then what you have is, is what's out there right now, which is completely blocked sidewalks. And the other, I, I agree with everything um, that Ashley was saying about education, enforcement should be a very last option. But you know, if, if you remove all criminal penalties from a law, then it's not a law and there's no recourse if someone says, no, I refuse to move. And, you know, that that is is really the crux of it. We have right now an ordinance that authorizes city employees to move property to to make room for ADA. But it's just too big of a city. We cannot on a daily basis ensure ADA compliance for 10,000 miles of sidewalk. And, you know, I'm, I'm fearful of the budget crisis that we're facing 400 to 600 million dollars, our ability to, to move that property and keep those sidewalks clean and accessible is going to be nearly impossible unless we get some voluntary compliance. Uh, Sheila, you. do you have more questions? No, no, I appreciate the response. Okay, great. So uh, let's go on to Michael Connolly. Go ahead. Uh, it's good to be near the end of the questioning because lots of my questions have been answered. Um, I, I'll start with a comment and then into a question. I mean, I love to hear, it, I feel like that both sides of this are kind of have the same end goal, right? Um, that's very positive. Like I love, you know, everybody's very passionate about this. You know, to, to Sheila's point, it's impossible and it's only getting worse. We've, you know, and I'm just saying the collective we have failed terribly um, and everybody's suffering, right? To lesser and greater extent, obviously, uh, you know, it, it's no easy task to live on the streets. Um, but you cannot at this point, and we're all sort of in COVID stay at home. There's many families and many children. You cannot you cannot go south to Hollywood on any sort of north-south street from Argyle all the way to Wilton. It's impossible. And it's only gotten worse and worse and worse. And there's no, you know, I, I oftentimes look at the, the folks that are the outreach folks, like why is, I never see an outreach person out there when I drive by to sort of see what's going on. Like, why isn't there an education internally to sort of, you know, it just gets, you know, we live in a high fire zone. As I sit here, you know, there were two citizens fires right here, you know, people setting trash can fires. You know, there's, there's got to be some solution. We live, we are a, you know, a civilization based on laws and we all have to sort of follow certain, you know, we have a covenant with each other. And, you know, I got a ticket on Franklin, you know, it, I broke the law and I got a ticket and I have to deal with that. You know, I love what you said, Dennis, about the diversion program, because I think that's I think that's so, a big so, solution. So Michael, Michael, I, How, I, that's my a, question that you let okay, George, okay. you let everybody talk for 25 minutes. We no, but I, about, I, no, 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 right, we're going to we're going to come to get, our chances to coming, talk. My question's okay, coming. My question's ask your coming. question. So what is the you know, what is that diversion program look like? Like how real of that is in this ordinance? to sort of make that sort of stick and sort of be a, a primary way versus someone getting stuck in the system and just having a bunch of tickets or whatever. I, I think criminalization is a strong word in this. I, I don't think, you know, that that's the right word, but how, how, how strong is the diversion program element to this ordinance, if at all? Um, I'm not the best person to speak on that. The, the city attorney's program is called HEART. It stands for a homeless engagement something something. Um, Michael, I've got a, I know I, I read a staff report on it. I, I don't know exactly how it works, but the basic principle is, I mean, just so everyone knows, you, you, when you, you get charged with something, the, the officer has the choice of either 
um, on a on a misdemeanor case like this. It's a, a wobbler. He could either write a criminal infraction citation um, or as a very last scenario arrest. No one gets transported to Men's Central. They would be released from Hollywood Division Jail after they have been booked. And then at that point in time, um, they would be referred to the city attorney's homeless uh, or heart program. And I don't know exactly how the mechanics of that work. It's a, it's a separate office, but the idea is, you know, they will drop the charges. Getting arrested is just kind of the, the law enforcement art is, is bringing you up and is, is telling the prosecutors, but it's really up to the prosecutor to actually file those criminal charges. So, so I, I wanna be clear about that. If someone gets arrested, that doesn't necessarily mean city attorney is gonna go after and prosecute them. In, in every circumstance, that, that is the, the last thing that we try to do. I mean, just from a caseload perspective, the, the city to, to actually prosecute someone through the court process is very long and intensive. And we have a lot more serious misdemeanors um, that the city attorney should be prosecuting and, and focusing their efforts on. So Michael, I can't, I, I unfortunately, I don't know. It's called the heart program. Um, there's probably a staff report that I could send you for more, more details about how it works. Um, okay, Michael, do you have another question? Okay, uh, next is uh, Bianca. Cool, thanks. Um, Dennis, Gabby, thank you for being here and making the hall to talk to folks who are not in your district. It's great to have you guys up here. Um, just wanted to touch on a quick question. When you, you guys have acknowledged in your comments, um, LA is a giant city, a beastly city, a dramatically different city where there are beds in Wilmington, there are not beds in Hollywood. What virtue does Councilman Bruce Gaino see in this blanket ordinance that will so disparately affect different neighborhoods of our city? Um, that is a, it's always tricky because we are one city. Um, we can't really uh, pass an ordinance and say this only applies to, to this area and not this area unless we have what's called a, a rational basis. It's the equal protection clause of the, the 14th amendment, for example. You know, if you, you'd have a rational basis to treat uh, R1, the height limit in an R1 district different than the, the height limit in, in uh, you know, C2, but you can't treat R1 property in one district different than, than the rest. This is a little bit different because we're kind of operating under, we're kind of legislating with this, yes, but at the same time, it's in conjunction with the larger LA Alliance case and the, the settlement that the city and, and county um, are, are trying to, to move towards. And that settlement is going to be based on council districts. And so because we're one city, we need to have the ordinance in place, but the council districts that meet that that threshold that that build the housing and the the tiny house villages and and all the other uh measures in place once they get there they would be allowed to enforce this this ordinance but again at that point only if the shelter bed is available just because we reach that 60 in, in council district 4 council district um, 13 uh, actually enforcing against someone would require for there to be an option a bed available and um, for them them to say no uh, okay uh, and uh, did you have anything more Bianca um, just in touching on to how I know you've talked, we've talked a little bit about the number of beds available and not available. Um, have displacements and evictions from COVID-19 been factored into the beds that we need to add for shelters? How do we see that playing into enforcement of this given this continuing crisis? Oh, you bring up a really good point. We may be facing a wave of evictions. I'm very fearful of that. I'm fearful that our homeless population will increase um, dramatically. As it stands right now, we're using the 2020 homeless count results in that, that lawsuit when we're talking about the 60% the threshold. But there are um, two interveners in the case. Uh, I think it's LA County, uh, I'm sorry, Orange County Catholic Worker and I forget the other organization, but there are advocates for the homeless in those those court proceedings. And, you know, I uh, there's some some really tough attorneys, Shayla Myers, um, Brooke Wiseman and Carol Sobel um, are going to be watching this like a hawk. And I imagine that if we have a whole bunch of numbers, if there's a whole flood of people that come on the, the streets, 
they're probably they're not gonna to sign on to the agreement. So I think, you know, we're we're months away from that agreement. But if the the ground suddenly shifts and we have you know, God forbid, 20, uh, 10,000 more, more people on our streets. I'm sure that the interveners in that lawsuit are not going to agree to settle based upon those um, 2020 count numbers. Okay. Um, the the estimates are it's about 120,000 households that could be evicted um, in the next coming months, right? So 10,000 is a, a, would be a very low estimate of potential new um, people experiencing homelessness. Yeah. Uh, and we already know the numbers numbers are up. Like that is a fact um, from the data that I've collected. We have at least a 30% increase uh, in June of youth experiencing homelessness. But just to be clear to everyone, the city does have an eviction moratorium in place for the entire city of Los Angeles. Um, and it lasts until the end of the state of emergency declaration, which can either be ended by the mayor or if the council votes, I think with 10 votes, we can, we can end the state of emergency. Once that happens, everyone has a 12 month period to, to repay any back rent and eviction proceedings wouldn't happen. So we're talking I'm not saying it's not an issue. It's going to be an issue, I think, especially in, in some of our surrounding cities and other parts of the state. But here in the city of Los Angeles, we do have an ordinance in place. It was challenged by the um, Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. They tried to get an injunction in place and the city prevailed in that initial um, request. That doesn't mean all the litigation is over, but um, initial uh, indication from Judge uh, Pragerson in in that case is that our ordinance is uh, constitutional and he did not agree to uh, an injunction. Okay. Uh, Bianca, do you have anything more? Nope. Thanks, George. Okay. Okay. Uh, lastly, we have Andrew and then we're going to go to public comment. Andrew, go ahead. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for all of your passion and care about this topic on both sides. I really appreciate it. Uh, you kind of already started talking about what I wanted to bring up or ask about was the wave of new homeless that we're going to see, but specifically framed inside what we're talking about this evening, um, because obviously we have two different points of view that are trying to solve this issue. How do the two sides of you guys see what we're talking about play out in our future? Because we're kind of talking about now, but really the future is what we're looking at here. And then um, the other question that I had is um, for crafting by council. I don't understand that as far as if, if I wanna live somewhere, I just don't go there and then say, I want you to house me. So if, if you could give me a little insight if, if it's there as to why we're driving housing based on where anyone wants to live. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it doesn't make any sense to me that I could walk anywhere in any, any area of Los Angeles and say, I want you to house me. You know, okay. I can't go live wherever I want. So we have two questions. The first one is um, uh, about, uh, frame that first question again. Specifically what we're looking at, how do you guys think oh, this is going to play out in the future? Because we're looking at a big wave of increase of homelessness. And are we clearing the freeways? Is that what we're doing? We're going to do each freeway for two weeks. Then we're going to clear them out. And this is a gap, uh, a gap stop to try to save our community so we can still function. Or, or what are we looking at here? What's the intent? Okay. So there's one is that. And then the second one is how, why is it broken down by council instead of looking at it as a whole? Is that correct? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me that we're, okay. we're putting the burden on just arbitrary saying how many, how many people end up in your district, you have to build housing for them. Okay. So, so, so Glenn, why don't you, and then, and Robin, why don't you both uh, take like 30 seconds to talk about how you see this place out in the future. And then we'll, we can then address the issue of breaking it down by council district. I'll start. Ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that I think that's okay. a really good point that i um, you know, we have a lot, we need to be addressing homelessness on all spectrums from preventing I uh, like, stopping the wave of evictions that turn into, you know, our cheapest, most effective way to end homelessness is to stop it right before it starts, right? So that's something that we need to be focusing resources on. Um, I think that we're thinking, you know, I think this idea that we 
have an urgency to change, like to rush this motion through, change municipal code to clear some encampments under freeways um, is like really conflating, like hyper-focusing on one small part of this um, when we really need to be focusing our resources across the board. And this, this will really divert a lot of resources into the wrong places that won't end the solution. Uh, like it, that's just kind of what I'll say on the short end. On your second question, I, I didn't really understand it. So maybe we can do it again. Oh, well, let, let's let Glenn talk about the, the first question, which is how do you see this playing out in the, in the, in, in the future and you know, what'll be happening, especially in light of COVID and such. I would say uh, we agree. I mean, Robin, I'm on the same place. I remember I had a meeting with Greg Spiegel, um, who was uh, Mayor Garcetti's first homelessness uh, coordinator. And I will never forget, he told me there's three legs to ending homelessness. Honestly, I can't remember what two of them were, but the one I'll never forget is prevention because it costs 10 times as much when someone is, is out on the street to get them housing than to simply prevent them from becoming homeless in the first place. And you know, that is something, something, some things that the, the city council have done. This, this may not seem like much, but we adopted a $15 an hour minimum wage before the rest of the state. We had a more aggressive schedule for, for getting people that, that money so they're able to afford rent. Is $15 an hour enough to, to afford, you know, a one bedroom apartment? No, I don't think it's even that is good enough. Um, we created a, a um, rental assistance program when, when COVID it started to assist renters with that. But, you know, I do want to say we need help from the federal government because we're kind of being told by the courts, you know, you, you can't enforce these ordinances per Martin v. Boise un, until you have housing available, but we're not getting the support from the, the federal government to provide housing. You know, we, there needs to be an increase in the rate of um, Section 8 vouchers, both the number issued and the and the the maximum dollar amount for each voucher. We're in a, a bizarre situation now where the VASH vouchers, the, the veterans vouchers are worth more than the Section 8. So you do have, you know, some landlords that are willing to to rent to, to formerly homeless want to hold out for a veteran because the VASH voucher is worth more than the Section 8 voucher. So you know, that's something Councilman Busca, you know, up until I think Friday will be president of National League of Cities. He has been advocating tirelessly. I would encourage everyone on this call to reach out to your, your federal representatives um, because, you know, people always ask, well, why, what is the city doing? Cities are in the business of essentially emergencies. We operate the 911 system and police and fire and, and infrastructure and you know, sometimes utilities. We are the level of government that is least capable of providing housing. We've gotten into it the last few years because we have a crisis out there. But, you know, we've been advocating for assistance from the federal government. Bring in the FEMA trailers. Bring in, you know, the, the, the full kind of response that you would have as though this were an earthquake and we had, you know, 40,000 people that, that used to have houses and were displaced because of, of an earthquake. Okay, Dennis. So, uh, uh, um, so Andrew, you had this question about why do they break it up? Keep going, and, George. Keep going. Okay. 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 Keep going. So, okay. So, so we have um, thirty-four attendees, of which there are seventeen hands up. And so, I initially said we were going to give two minutes. Uh, I'm going to limit it to one minute comment for everybody because uh, it's still uh, eight. 15 and I, I would like to have some comments from the board members as well. So first up is um, Celeb or Caleb, excuse me, Caleb, did you want to say something? Yeah, Caleb. Uh, I'm sorry. First, yeah, no worries at all. First off, I think it's unbelievably pathetic and telling that Blue Sky Inno and Blue Midfield have been going around to each and every neighborhood council that is not their own when they didn't have the votes previously, trying to court you all to get you to support something that is absolutely egregious. I'm blown away. This is a criminalization motion. They told you what it is. They've said it multiple times. There is not enough housing available. You have professionals on this call on this panel with you that have told you that we don't have adequate housing that you need 
in order to give people the care that is that they deserve. Okay. And also I want to say, Dennis, by the way, you said in a call last night on your tour to neighborhood councils that sweets are somehow compassionate and kind. I would encourage you to actually go out and observe them because they give people a literal 15 minute countdown. So at best you are a coward because you're not just taking marching orders and at worst you are a monster for peddling this lie. Sweeps are vile, they are evictions, they are violent, okay? So this board, I know and I've seen you do great things in the past. You need to stand up to these people, tell them that they need to stick to their district, which they're not already good at running. They need to stop showing up to councils and doing things. Okay, thank you. So uh, just to be clear, we asked uh, Council Member Buscaino to come to our meeting because one of our board members wanted to have this brought before us. And for it to be fair uh, and not just have one-sided, we felt it was important that we reach out to one of the movers of the motion. And uh, Glenn and Gabby uh, generously uh, agreed to come. So this was not about them pitching to us, we requested to them. Next we have is uh, Damon. Go ahead, Damon, you're allowed to uh yeah can you hear me yes go ahead thank you yeah george uh, i just want to mention um that's really nice that they accepted your invitation but councilman bonin uh actually had the class to not come and uh pitch you know whatever it is that they're selling buscaino joey buckets is going around the city with bob blumenfeld trying to pitch this and push it through all over the city. It's it's really a gross ethical uh, violation. And Dennis, we heard you last night at Venice. You obviously were taking notes on uh, what lies you had to spew tonight. You know the truth. You don't have enough beds. There aren't enough beds in this city. And you keep spinning it and you keep talking about what you're gonna do, but you don't have enough beds right now. And that's an undeniable fact. And this does criminalize homelessness. You even, you let your mask slip at about 7.58 tonight and said, we need an enforcement mechanism, just like your boss, Joey Buckets did at the meeting with Judge Carter. And Judge Carter said, no, wrong. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, next we have is uh, uh, Gina Viola. Uh, Gina, go, go. Uh, hold on, Let's see, Gina. Gina, go ahead, it's, it's your time. Thanks, my name is Gina Viola. I'm a resident of Hollywood, not San Pedro, not Orange County. When we moved here, one of our first priorities was to familiarize ourselves with our neighborhood and its houseless neighbors. In 2013, we met Raquel who lived on the corner of Highland and Franklin. She rarely asked us for anything. One day she disappeared. I hope that the family she told me about in Italy did find her. I tell this story because my children were six and seven years old at the time. Yesterday, my now 13 year old returned home from walking the dog and told me how a kind neighbor on that same corner greeted him and asked him for some food. My son went across the street to Starbucks and purchased him a sandwich. He was not frightened or threatened at any point in time. Do you know why? Because my son sees this man as his neighbor, as a human. If more of you would raise your children to see the same, our houseless crisis would cease to be one. Ordinances like 4118 will only increase this problem as criminalization does not work. That's what we've been doing for the last 30, no, 100 plus years. We need social- Okay, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, we really have to, to be, um, and I, I apologize, but we really have to limit it because we have so many people who want to say something and I don't want to make people stay really long, as long as it's going to go. So um, the, the next one we have um, is, um, is the People's Council. Um, uh, let's see, uh, People's Council. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. This is Richie Serjanko from the People's City Council. I just want to say we were outside Joe Buscaino's house last night, almost got jumped by his very angry neighbors. Um, and I just want to say, like, Dennis and Gabby, like, I wonder, like, do you either have, have souls? Like, you guys were here fucking lying. You were gaslighting the board. You didn't say one fucking truthful thing for you okay, to hey, hold on, say, hold on, hold on. Hey, okay, look, we're not going to use foul language. Okay, if, if you okay. want to, no if you want to, if you, 
uh, please. No foul language. I got it. I got it. I got it. I just, I, I, it's like it, the motion explicitly criminalizes laying, sitting on the sidewalk and says they can be arrested. Gabby, you're shaking your head. You're a fucking liar. You work for a okay. piece of shit. Cut him, okay. cut him, George. Come on. Yeah, this yeah, isn't, no. we're not, I, they're I, not I, here I, to be abused. Uh, uh, I know. I did, I did cut him. Um, okay, next we have uh, Michael Connick. Hello, neighbors. Thank you for your service. I am a tax-paying property owner right here in Hollywood. And... I am asking you as my neighbors to be righteous, to be kind, and to be compassionate. We all know at the heart, this motion is merely just a kind of angry acting out for all of us who live here who are frustrated with the situation. But I think our frustration and our anger is much better directed at the people like Mitch O'Farrell and David Rue and Buscaino and the city council that has for years rubber stamped luxury condo projects while neglecting to build the housing that we all know we desperately need. So neighbors, I am asking you, please do not make the weakest among us, don't make their life even harder be kind, be compassionate, and direct your disappointment and frustration where it really belongs. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have uh, Sophie Bridges. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Sophie. Hi, thank you. Um, I've lived in Hollywood my entire life. I vote in this community. My parents own a home in this community. And I'm just saying that because I want you to know that I'm a stakeholder. And I think the stakes tonight are extremely high. I'm calling in to, vote, to ask you to vote to oppose this inhumane motion. Um, I'm really grateful to the board for bringing advocates who actually work with our unhoused neighbors to the meeting tonight. I especially want to thank Aaron for those really thoughtful comments and questions about women and families um, in shelters. I think it's really important that we don't lose sight that shelters don't accommodate all people experiencing homelessness. The reality is science shows that sweeps and criminalization do not work, services do. And I think giant red flags should go up for any thinking person in this room when staffers from Joe Buscaino's office come here to say this is not criminalization yet are here to speak on a motion that fundamentally literally says it would be illegal to sit, sleep or store property on many streets throughout our community. Finally, we cannot ignore that this is a motion that is coming to our neighborhood council from outside our community from people who clearly have not done the work to bring actual statistics and actual information about our actual neighborhoods to the meeting. Joe Busca, you know, does not work for us. I would urge this council to not squander the legitimacy that they have and support this motion. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Uh, next, we have David Gad. Go ahead, David. David, you have to unmute. Okay, hi, sorry. Um, well, for a change of pace, I'd like to say I'm fully in support of the of the motion. And um, as someone who has reported numerous, numerous times the obstruction of sidewalks in my neighborhood, which is Argyle and Franklin, going down Vine Street, the sidewalks are completely blocked. And uh, everyone's expressing sympathy for the homeless who might get hit by a car. But I'm also very concerned about pedestrians who pay taxes who might get hit by cars because the homeless have their belongings not only all over the sidewalk but out into the street taking up parking spots something has to be done about this i fully support the motion thank you okay thank you uh next uh we have is uh jessica go ahead jessica jessica Jessica, can you unmute Jessica? Okay, so we're going to go on to Kendall. I'll bring up uh, uh, Kendall Mayhew. Um, go ahead, Kendall. Hi, I have a procedural question first. Is this the time period when we're supposed to ask questions? Uh, not. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. I was curious. Uh, go ahead, Buscaino. ask your question. 
and then you I'm can curious make the for Buscaino staffers why um, we should trust uh, Buscaino to support tenant protections when he voted against the eviction moratorium that they talked about as a reason why we won't see unhoused people uh, population growing. Um, okay, well, uh, this is this is a little bit of outside of this. Let's let's let's. Well, that's just not it. true. I mean, he voted for it. That's just not true. He voted for it. I can send you the council action and I'm um, check with the I mean, city. I clerk. have one of the file. I have the city clerk file okay, on it. So and he's quoted an Elias article saying that he's concerned about tenants who engage in prostitution and drug use in their apartments. Okay, As yeah, not to support an eviction. Board that's board. an at fault eviction, and we we drafted the ordinance so that it only applies to no fault evictions. If you're engaging in criminal activity, then yes, you're not protected by the eviction uh, moratorium. That is correct. Okay, I was just so trying to get clarity on that because we okay, are going to okay. see an overwhelming surge of unhoused people in this city right now because we don't have substantial protections for renters after this moratorium ends. And we don't know when that moratorium will end. So people are on a knife's edge right now and worried every time this comes up every couple months. And, and that's something that I think needs to be taken really seriously. So I'm, I'm just curious about why this is a priority for Buscaino's office, this enforcement mechanism, when it hasn't been a priority to create real actual rent cancellation, which is something that Nithya Raman's team laid out and proposed how the city council could actually do it on their own, not kicking it to the federal government, but actually LA city council. So I, I'm just, I'm trying to understand why this is the priority and not actually keeping people from becoming unhoused when we are actually, we are housing people, but we aren't able to do it quick enough because people are becoming homeless so quickly. Can that I mean, be answered too? I would just counter this no, is a, not a priority. The, the, it has not been uh, the priority of the city for the last um, five years. And and I'm going on the advice our lawyers have told us. And, and I respect other people's positions, but our city attorney has told us that canceling rent violates the contract cause, uh, clause of the U.S. Constitution. And they're our legal advisor. I don't, you know, they're the ones who, who, who okay, give us our advice. The, I, I appreciate that. This is really not, a, I, I, we could turn this into a, a, a symposium on homelessness issues and those things related that 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 feed into it um, we're really talking about a specific ordinance and I, let's let's try to focus on that so now we have Jacob uh, Wucher Jacob go ahead you have a minute hello this is Jacob Wucher from Streetwise LA I am a lazy who spends every waking hour interrupting neighborhood council meetings hell I don't even live anywhere near Hollywood okay so um, next, let's uh, bring up uh, Peter Clune. Peter? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, first I'd like to uplift all the really wonderful comments. Um, thanks Robin and Ashley for coming on and providing just really wonderful insight. Um, but I'd you know, like to bring up a point or specifically in terms of Buscaino's office, um, you know, we're being told tonight that criminalization is a, you know, sort of last resort um, and that the LA Alliance lawsuit is gonna act as sort of this limiting principle. But what we've seen, especially out of that office is that the city has already been held in contempt in the Garcia lawsuit because of their actions, because they chose to illegally conduct sweeps while there was an injunction. And then they were then held in contempt. That's not correct. I'm sorry. That that's is, just that not is, correct. That that's not correct. It was that we had let's, metal let's, signs. Let's, my let's, public let's, comment let's, need to be quiet. Let's let him have his public comment, please. Right. So y y the city was held in contempt for posting illegal signs that lied to people about bulky items, specifically in San Pedro, in Buscaino's district. Right. So we're being told to trust them to exercise restraint in this case when what we've seen is a pattern of behavior of pushing maximal punishment and maximal criminalization. And that's what's gonna happen here, right? They don't deserve that trust. They haven't earned it. They haven't shown that they deserve it. And the fact that they're supporting this motion instead of Mike Bonin's substitute motion, which actually speaks towards housing and real- okay. Thank you. Uh, we, we have to keep it to the minute, I'm sorry. Uh... Uh, we, our next one is uh, Peter Clune. Um, hold on a second, I lost you. Um, go ahead, Peter. So I, 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 I just spoke, but I'm, I'm happy to, to continue oh, going. Uh -huh. uh, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. 
Uh, so the next one is is uh, Samantha. Um, Samantha. Hey, can you all hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, it's nice to address you guys again. It's been a little bit. Um, as a resident stakeholder here in Beachwood Canyon, I strongly oppose the proposed amendment to 4118. This utterly inhumane proposal offers no solutions, only punishment, and will further criminalize and marginalize the most vulnerable among us. This at a time when the pandemic is in its second peak surge with no rent relief in sight and as only more people and families find themselves on the precipice of houselessness themselves. This proposal wants people who have nowhere to go because there isn't enough shelter, there isn't enough supportive housing to basically disappear. And if they don't, they will face the hammer of the law. The presentation from Buscaino's reps emphasize that this motion is not criminalization, but it is intentionally vague and essentially holds houseless people hostage. Take the housing that is offered regardless of if it meets your specific needs or face criminalization. And there isn't enough housing, there isn't enough shelter, and that should be where our efforts are focused. Um, you know, that the cycle of poverty, they just get trapped in, um, gets them further and further away from what we all want, which is to see them in long-term supportive housing. Uh, okay, thank, thank you, Samantha. So, uh, Glenn, Glenn is, uh, did, did, did you switch spots there on us, Glenn? Is that me? Uh, Yes, I, I, I don't know. Somebody's there's a lot of people with very odd fake names. So uh, I, I guess this is you. Um, did, did go ahead. It's yours. You know. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that I appreciate this council um, being. Uh, trying to be empathetic. Um, it seems like there were a lot of good questions asked. There's some bad questions asked too, um, but I just want to speak to the fact that Buscaino is trying to push this through aggressively um, and lying directly to your faces. As a council, I don't. I would urge you not to be intimidated or pressured by his um, people uh, because just because they're here and talking about it. Uh, Bonnet has a much better motion. Buscaino is literally trying to criminalize homelessness, whether or not he lies to your face or not about it. Um, in the law, it says uh, making it illegal to do things like like exist <laughs> in encampments, and uh, and and he literally tried to make it sound like being arrested wasn't a big deal. So uh, I I think that there's a lot of lies going around in this in this in this in this meeting from Buscaino's side, um, and I would urge you to vote no on this on this motion because. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, the next one is uh, Gordon Potter. Gordon, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi, hi, hi. Thank you. Um, you have to lower your, your sound on your device. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, just, you know, speaking towards sort of things that are seen have been really positive tonight. I mean, we heard Ashley earlier mention, you know, when what happens when you, you know, bring people who are directly affected to the table um, and sort of empower them, you know, and, and bringing our house neighbors together and giving them the tools and empowerment, you know, to work on ADA issues, which we all want to work on, right? Those are models that we should be looking to. Those are the things that will sort of bring people together and solve these problems without resorting to this criminalization that seems to be sort of the, the first thing that sort of the reactionary wing of our city council wants to continue to push, which has gotten us into the situation in the first place. Um, and so, you know, I just, you know, when I echo a lot of what's been said earlier, you know, look for that compassion, look for those ways to not think in sort of a paternalistic way of how do we leverage people or how do we force people out of a lifestyle choice as Gabriella called being unhoused to, to, to give people the tools and meet them where they are to help solve the problems that we as a city need to work on. Because putting- Okay, thank you, Gordon. Uh, like I said, I'm sorry that I have to cut you off, but if we have to, uh, kind of treat every single speaker the same minute. And so if you can try to get your thoughts out in a minute, I appreciate it because it's 8.30 and nobody even on their council has been able to weigh in on this. Um, uh, Jamie, go ahead. Hi, my name's Jamie. Um, 
So I just, I, I find it really peculiar that a council members here, like a staff members speaking sort of like as a member of the board um, about this. I just wanted to say that. Um, we, so we actually, late, we brought both uh, the council member and the uh, services, not Streep's people, to be part of the, as panelists, so they could uh, speak I understand freely. Me, you're like interrupting people and like, you know, I was able to like cut people off and so it was just, that's just kind of weird. I just wanted to say that. Um, but I also, I just wanted to remind y'all that y'all got to hear from a doctor, like uh, she was actually is a doctor and she studies this. And she also spoke to like one of the main organizers of outreach and activism to our houseless neighbors here in Hollywood. And they actually are lending you their time. And these other people are just like contradicting them. Um, but yeah, the, I just also want to say like, one of them said that like n the camp, like making sure to enforce the no camping outside of the services was like enabling homelessness, like allowing people to camp outside of services. And I was just wondering what, how they made that argument. There's not really any research of that grounds of basis. And I just also wanted to point that as well. Uh, also the homeless um, Hollywood. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, remember uh, one minute. Uh, so um, let's see, uh, Jamie. Uh, Jamie P. Okay, let's move on to Nigel. Uh, Nigel, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for um, <clears throat> hearing about this, guys. It's an important issue. You know, there's a lot of talk, I think, about uh, making this motion sound really flowery and nice. Unfortunately, if you read it, it, it isn't. It's cruel and it's ineffective. Um, I mean, Dennis Gleason himself said it's not an, a solution to homelessness. I mean, that's really all you need to hear. I, I think it's important to ask why they're pushing this motion so hard and they're going to different neighborhood councils. Um, but, you know, this motion doesn't do a lot. It doesn't provide more housing. It doesn't focus on where these people are going to go and how to get them into housing. It, it just outlines punishment if they are offered housing, that's all it does. Um, and this idea that arrests are somehow not bad because it won't be prosecuted. If someone comes into your home and arrests you and books you and then later on says you're free to go, you're not gonna be happy about that. You're still invading people's lives and criminalizing them for a living by arresting them. So, so just cause they might not go through the whole process of prosecution, that's not enough for this to not be criminalization. Thank you, Nigel. Um, uh, Jamie Penn, did you, are you back on? Jamie? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just wanted to say that I wanted to reclaim some of the time that I already spoke already once, spoke. but I, I was cut off for a few seconds. I just, I'd like to actually claim my time. Um, cause I just, uh, I okay. A, I, I actually <laughs> gave you, Jamie, I actually gave you more time, but I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay. okay. I, I just want to state that the home, the Hollywood homeless youth partnership in 2019, the Hollywood youth providers, they, they serve like 3,500 youth and there were only 417 beds. So, I mean, this claim that like there is enough that it's, and that there, there are services to offer. This is just false. There's, there are no grounds, no basis for these claims. Um, I really hope Thank you oppose this, this, uh, this statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so then next we have, um, looks like, let's see. Um, it's Jane, Jane, go ahead, Jane. Hello, hi, uh, this is uh, Jane and I uh, am a little bit confused as to why there is such a rush to get this motion passed uh, from the time that it was introduced to the time that it was voted or it was, uh, there was scheduled a vote at the city council meeting. It was one week and there are so many more questions than there are answers. First of all, you can't produce a map. You don't have a system for uh, getting people into shelter. Um, so this uh, doesn't really make any sense when you drag your feet on everything else, when you drag your feet on providing housing and shelter. So city council has always prioritized criminalization over actual services and it's reflected in our city budget. So the person who says, How, we don't have money to keep our sidewalks clean. Well, we do, all of our money is in the police budget. So we need to defund the police. Uh, $3 billion goes to the police. Only 300, 
$400 million goes to homelessness services. So we need to commandeer the hotels, we need to defund the police, and that's how we solve homelessness. It's not through criminalize, criminalizing people, because where are people going to go? There are no shelter beds, there's no housing. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, next is Bridget. Uh, Bridget, uh, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks so much for everyone for being here. And thanks to Robin and Ashley for everything you said. I just want to uh, remind everyone, there's a lot of language tonight about they and people that we are talking about, people living unhoused, they're our neighbors, right? There's no they, there's only us. If you disagree, please don't interrupt me, Dennis. Please enjoy your hot meal. Um, I just want to also remind you that on April 22nd, Busca, you know, voted no on the eviction moratorium. Uh, I'm asking all of you to vote to oppose this brutal measure which criminalizes poverty. We have so many resources in the city. We are to resources what George's wall is to mounted guitars. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bridget. Um, uh, next we have is Tommy. Tommy, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I'm a stakeholder in Hollywood. I live here. I uh, do outreach to a lot of people on the street. Um, I'm asking, why aren't there any unhoused people in this meeting? Like, if you think somebody has an issue when they go into a shelter, you should ask them, why aren't they going into a shelter? That's a problem that Aaron uh, illuminated earlier. 60% um, uh, is a ridiculous number, and it's just chopping at the knees of Martin v. Boise, which said it was cruel and unusual to sweep people without shelter. Um, if people are refusing services, your services are bad and you should ask them why they aren't going into your services. Um, arrests are incredibly violent and traumatic. If I tell you to go into a shelter and you say no, and then I punch you in the face and take you to the ground and then bend your arm behind your back, that's what an arrest is. That's what happens. So don't just like gloss over an arrest like it's no big deal and that it's actually a good thing for people because it's incredibly traumatic and fucking evil. Okay, Tommy, uh, I, I'm, so I, I will, uh, just as a matter of course, we're gonna have to, uh, uh, if, if somebody uses profanity, I'm just gonna disable your talking. So um, so I guess it's a good idea for, for Tommy to keep it towards the end if he wants to use that. Uh, so, <laughs> Sophie, go ahead, Sophie, your turn. Sophie? Hi, I already spoke, but I do want to, I was cut off, so if I can finish my comment. Well, no, 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 no. We're, we're, you know, everybody gets one minute and we can't allow people to have um, uh, more than that time because then I have to go back and allow everybody else to get another one minute. Yeah, yeah. No, all, all, all I want to say is I have high hopes for this council because um, back in June I was actually at a Black Lives Matter rally and you guys were handing out masks and water and sanitizer and so I just I think you guys can do better and I really believe in you and I, I just okay. I really don't want you to um, use the political capital you have to support Joe Buscaino who just doesn't he doesn't deserve your support. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Kendall, uh, I know that you um, want, to want to speak. Uh, you had a minute um, and, and, and you spent it on grilling about something or other. I will give you 30 seconds to finish your comment because I, I, you're, you're, you, you, you kind of strayed on that. But, but so, so go ahead. Kendall. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because I, I was under the impression that there was a question period and then later a comment period. So I appreciate it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's just in, the reason I pointed out the no vote on the eviction moratorium, which is true. He did vote no on April 22nd. Um, you can check the council file if you'd like. Um, is because it's really important to understand the motivations of Boscaino's office with this motion and why it is that he's trying to use the neighborhood councils. He's trying, he is expecting that this neighborhood council is not gonna do their homework. I don't think he's familiar with this neighborhood council because I personally have been at this neighborhood council many times as a stakeholder and have seen that the members of this neighborhood council do care about this and will do your homework and won't just take what Joe Buscino, Joe Buscino and his, his delegates tell you as fact, this is a criminalization ordinance. It will terrorize unhoused people through arrest if you give police tools, they will use them. That's what okay, we've okay, seen here in Los okay. Angeles. So please okay, don't okay. give the police more tools 
to okay. arrest people. Thank, thank, thank you. I, I, um, <laughs> I, I feel like I'm one of the, uh, the, uh, the moderators at a vice presidential debate. Okay, so Lisa um, Redmond, go ahead, Lisa, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, I wanna just, let's talk reasonable here. You're really putting the, this motion puts the cart in front of the horse. I mean, Gabby and Dennis's boss whined to Judge Carter in the LA Alliance lawsuit two weeks ago at the last hearing about that there has to be consequences, there has to be consequences. And Judge Carter was like, no, we can't do that, get me the housing. And this motion does not address housing whatsoever. That's why I ask you to support Bonin's separate motion because right now, fine, if you're gonna criminalize people, it doesn't solve anything. All you're doing is playing a giant shell game by moving people from one place to another. And that's gonna take people from the streets and push them deeper into the residential neighborhoods, deeper up into the hills where there's brush fire opportunities. Do you realize that because there's no shelter, that's why people are living under freeways because now it's the rainy season coming up. And it seems like just a few weeks ago, it was hotter than Hades. People were living under the freeways for coolness, for shelter from the sun. Please be reasonable. We can't, I've lost my train of thought. Um, I believe in you. Oh, most CISs, okay, okay. the majority we, we, of CISs we, we, already we, come uh, in are uh, not okay, supporting Lisa, this motion. Uh, thank, okay, thank you, thank you, Lisa. We, like I said, we gotta keep you guys to one minute or else it'll just, it'll just get really long like it like it isn't already. So um, we have a Lionel. Lionel, go ahead. Yes, good evening. Thank you for having me here. Um, to, I'm supportive of helping the unhoused neighbors because many of them are suffering and due to job loss, uh, economics, um, the cost of um, rent and um, mental um, illness, Many of them who suffer from mental illness are not aware of what they're, what they're doing because they don't know, consciously speaking, what their actions are. So many of them need mental help. And I read research papers on this and, and it's sad because I've seen people talking to themselves on the streets and they're not aware of what they're doing. It's not their fault because mentally speaking, they're not aware of their actions, their behavior. So they need mental services and drug rehab and alcoholic rehab because many of them suffer from these kind of things that's destroying them from the inside. And, and we have to provide counseling or mental health services or some kind of agency that will help separate the um, unhoused neighbors who are suffering from mental illness from the ones who are capable of getting jobs and starting from there and providing at least some basic housing for them. That's my comment. Thank you, Lionel, appreciate it. Uh, so somebody, somebody named Joey Buckets, I guess uh, it's your turn, Joey. Uh, hey there. Uh, I'm actually here to talk about it. There, Bob Blumenfield and Joe Buscano, aka Joey Buckets, have been trying to ram this through in a hurry because they know that if people actually look at the text of this rule, they will see that it is litigation bait. It is absolutely cruel. And every single homelessness advocacy organization opposes this. Um, I just want to point out that not only did Blumenfield and Boscano both oppose an eviction moratorium during the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, in which the unemployment chart was a literal vertical line, um, I want to point out that Blumenfield and some of the other people who actually support this uh, have contributed the least amount of housing to this city, despite, li despite overseeing areas that have the highest resources and opportunities for folks. That's not a coincidence. That's exactly how systemic racism continues to perpetuate this system. This is why so many homeless people are people of color. You need to really look at how people in their council districts have fallen into homelessness because of their failure to actually build housing and institute any protections for people. Okay, thank you, Joey. Uh, next we have... Um... Jane K. Town. Jane, go ahead. This is Jane from K. Town. We hate the homeless. Bulldozer 10. 
Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, next we have uh, Cadillac Z. Um, Cadillac. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I just wanted to say I'm a, I'm a stakeholder. I live on Wilton and um, <laughs> this is actually the first meeting I've ever attended. A friend of mine told me to come and um, it, it's really remarkable. I, I hope this is a democratic process and you guys listen to the callers because it seems like every single person who's called in has been way more knowledgeable than the people from uh, Councilman Buscaino's office and they've debunked every single lie that came out of that office. So if your job as a neighborhood council is to listen to your stakeholders and the constituents and the voice of the people, it seems pretty obvious what you guys should do tonight. And that would be to oppose anything that Buscaino's office is supporting. So I hope you guys will oppose this. Um, and, you know, I, if you're going to do anything at all, you need to support uh, bond and substitute met, uh, motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have um, Brittany Nichols. Brittany, go ahead. Hello. I uh, just want to go ahead and let you all know that people can curse during public comment. It's actually illegal for you to tell people that they can't curse. Uh, Buscayano's office is doing a tour of neighborhood councils trying to garner support because they didn't have it. Corrects didn't support this. Corrects! Them showing up trying to coerce neighborhood councils into doing this is very funny. And I hope you all will listen to the people which city council often does not. You all are supposed to be part of the checks and balances of the system. And if you all don't yield the power you have to stand up for folks in your neighborhood, then what are you all doing? They're doing all of this so they can arrest people that don't have homes. That's the whole point of it. Where is this energy for anything else? This is not a solution. The only solution to homelessness is housing people. Anything that is not an additive or a resource to unhoused people is further entrenching people in homelessness. That's further inflicting violence and trauma on folks and that does not help. It makes it worse. This is common sense. Please oppose this crap and support Bonin's motion and stop cutting people off and let people curse if they want to. This is very angering and people are angry. Okay, thank you, Brittany. Um, uh, next we have uh, Danielle. Danielle, go ahead. Uh, Hollywood team. So you know your neighborhood, you know your urgency. So thank you all except Michael, who was complaining about getting a ticket and having to see unhoused people. Uh, George, kindly shame on you as well for letting the city come on here, waste 45 minutes of our time, interrupt our public comments, and then penalize us by saying you don't have enough time for letting us speak more than one minute. If this was a push, um, this all is just a push for ADA compliancy. I urge the city to find other ways to figure out how to fix our rooted sidewalks, our non braille transition curbs, you know, while you're at it, penalize all the businesses that people in wheelchairs can't even go into and use that money to fund homelessness. Beyond this, just check your process. Your Brown Act violations are wild tonight. No general comment to begin with, cutting people off, an agendized discussion that's not even included. Come on, do better. We're rooting for you guys. You guys so far are doing good work, but let's set a template for how to deal with people who are in this neighborhood, not coming in here using Orange County as templates. Thank you, good night. <laughs> Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, next one. Uh, now, we've already heard from the People City Council already. Um, Christina, go ahead. Hi, George. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess what I just don't understand is the criminalization part of it, because it seems like kind of a catch-22. You're defunding the police, so you're reducing the actual number of police that are working. So who's gonna arrest them? What will that really do, especially if there's no prosecution and prosecution takes years? And at the end, they're back on the street. I mean, that's what I just don't understand. Just a general comment. Bye. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I think we haven't heard from Alex yet. Alex, go ahead. Hi, y'all. Um, 
I uh, I live just down the street on Canyon and Franklin. I'm a little perturbed by the idea that we as a neighborhood would be uh, even considering um, a piece of legislation from CD15, which could not be further away from us. I've spent a lot of time with the folks under the Gower overpass, uh, around the neighborhood. These are our neighbors and we should be treating them as such. This, criminalize, this is, this is uh, you know, I think we should think about this. I'm sure most of the people on here are good Democrats. And when the Republicans talk about canceling Obamacare, but don't provide a plan instead, this is a very similar philosophy. Let's just criminalize homelessness, get them away, and there's no plan instead. And what it's gonna lead to is uh, 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 wasted tax dollars on policing and on prisons instead of money that could be going to treatment, um, that could be going to housing. Um, so let's just focus on the solution rather than on creating more problems. Okay, thank you. Um, Adrian, go ahead, Adrian. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. My name is Adrian Bristol. I am the worst math professor ever. We meet. Okay, and then lastly, we have Valerie. Um, Valerie. Valerie, do we have, can you unmute Hi, please? Hi, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, I just want to emphasize that you keep talking about the ADA, and that was something that um, Mr. Buscaino's office seemed to really talk about a lot. You know, most, not most, but many people who are homeless are disabled as well. The closest I've ever been in my life to being homeless was when I lost my home because of an injury that made it impossible for me to go up flights of stairs. And I lived in a non-ADA accessible home. Um, I think that the way you're scapegoating this on ADA regulations is completely ridiculous. I've never seen any of you care this much about ADA when it comes to the homes that we do live in or the other sidewalks in this city that are completely destroyed. And it's just not a good cover. Um, again, I, I many encampments, most encampments you go to, you'll see many folks with mobility scooters and wheelchairs. In fact, often um, at Streetwatch power up tables, we are the only people who let them charge their devices. There's literally nowhere for people to charge their wheelchairs. And you're talking about this as an ADA issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so we have two more um, because People's Council, I'm gonna lower your hand because you already spoke once. Um, and I believe Sophie, um, let's see, Finn, or Charlie X, go ahead, Charlie. On the issue of ADA compliancy, please let speak people who are speaking with voice recorders or may have impairments. You don't have a chat that's open. Stop shutting people off and cutting them off just because you don't like the way they sound, George. Have a good night. Okay. So, uh, Finn. Uh, go ahead, Finn. My name is Finn. I am in a wheelchair. I cannot use the sidewalk. Clean up the fucking sidewalk. Okay. okay. So, um, let's see. I think, um, that's it. Okay, let's go on to um the uh, our uh board members <coughs> who here wants to make a comment let's kind of tr try to keep it to let's say a couple of minutes and then we can uh see if there's something we can um uh move on because it is um uh it is um a, a uh 
a long night. It's nine o'clock and we haven't even done anything. Okay, so first, uh, who, uh, Jim, why don't you start if you have anything to say? Okay, uh, it's been interesting listening to all this. Uh, the initial motion. And, 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 and I'm gonna, can we try to keep it to two minutes? No, you won't get two minutes. It'll be a little bit more now. We've been sitting here for a two hour or two and a half hours. You'll, okay. How many? How many minutes should we give? We give. You give what we got. How many people? How many should we give? Three I minutes. No, four, five tops, maybe four or three. Okay. Let's let's go. Let's go. I'll give everybody four minutes, and then we'll move on. Okay. We're Jimmy, you have four minutes. This, so yeah, it's you know. Anyway, I think the initial motion, which is interesting. Uh, it's, it certainly is unenforceable. Uh, the city's not enforcing these laws now. They certainly not be able to enforce them with a cutback in the police. I think the substitute, substitute motion makes the most sense. But I think what I find interesting is that it's all, it seems to be skirting around the cent, uh, one of the central issues. Uh, my wife and I were talking about this weekend. She's a psychotherapist and used to deal with some of the VA homeless, the, the VA vet, vets are coming out of the hills for treatment at West Westwood VA and then go back up the hills of post-traumatic stress folks. Uh, we're dealing with, according to the, the, the data, it seems to be anywhere from 45% to 50%. I see numbers as high as 67% of folks with mental illness. There's, there's nothing in the, the motion's nice. Uh, the substitute motion is good, but I think it is, it is neglect, it is circumventing the central issue of that we need to start funding a mental health program again. We don't need a for, for the young folks, you probably don't remember a place called Camarillo, but it was a major uh, mental facility. It wasn't very well respected, but it was a major mental facility and mental health facility in Camarillo is one of many across the state that over time the state just got rid of. And, and at that point, they emptied them all out onto the streets. Uh, and that's when the homeless problem really started does uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, so I, I think the motion's fine, but doesn't go far enough because all you're doing is putting a Band-Aid on the system uh, and a Band-Aid is not going to hold until you get a, a solid mental health component uh, to the back of it, underneath it. Uh, and it's got to be solid and it's going to be funded. Uh, taking it from the police is not, the, not necessarily going to be the way to go because I think once we see the decrease, of the, we're already been told it'll be 20, 20 uh, police uh, less in Hollywood division coming up, coming up shortly. Uh, that's 20 less cars on the road. Uh, we're already seeing a crime increasing in the hill. So, uh, and in the flat. So it's, we're, we're gonna, when we start seeing the results of the cut of the, of the virus on a budget, I think we're not gonna be all excited about wanting to uh, defund police, but money's, you gotta, you gotta address the central issue, which is the mental health issue, because otherwise they're all gonna be back out on the streets. Um, and um, I, I think that was my, my major concern. Um, uh, everything else, I say the substitute motion makes sense. Initial motion, I think is, uh, it's just not workable, whether, uh, regardless of whether or not it's humane or et cetera. Um, but I also would ask, add one other little piece and someone raised it also, because if it works and we have the decent mental health component, uh, this will also become a magnet perhaps for more of the folks out in the street or other cities trying to dump here. So you'd have to have to take a look at that and see how would you manage that? Because that would probably be a, a fact of life. Uh, you have to, you'd have to guard against cities turning LA in the dumping ground. So, but that was my, that was my main, my main issue with this substitute motion is that it really doesn't address the central problem of homelessness. And I'm not talking about the COVID-19, that's a separate issue. That's a once in a lifetime uh, catastrophe that'll have to be dealt with in a, in, in a separate manner and on a temporary manner, hopefully, because those people will be back in homes eventually once they get jobs. So that's, that's a totally different catastrophe. But the mental health issue, the one we're dealing with now is ongoing and has been ongoing for a while and growing. So I think, I think somehow I would support the substitute motion, but I, I'd add, there must be a strong mental health support component uh, to this motion and funded properly. Okay, very good. Jim, that was almost four minutes to, to the second. That, that's the four minute mark. So I give you kudos on that. Um, okay, so Brandy, go ahead, Brandy. I'm gonna give you four minutes now too. Go ahead. I'll do my best. Okay, you're gonna have to, yep. there we go. 
I first of all want to thank everyone who attended the meeting tonight. Um, it's clear how passionate everyone is. I do want to point out, though, to all attendees that just because uh, there are many people that, that do not feel the same way as the attendees, that doesn't mean that any one person's opinion is more important than the other. Um, I agree with Jim that the uh, motion is probably unenforceable, but where I differ with him is that the main issue here is that the Judge, Cor Judge Carter's order wasn't for our benefit to have people remove themselves from under the, under the overpasses. It is because it is to their benefit. Sitting on Plum, I've had to look at a number of documents that indicate that building a property within 500 feet of a freeway causes neurological damage, respiratory damage, uh, possible autism to children, uh, hearing loss. Uh, I would hope that the advocates here that are for the homeless recognize that if we're going to provide these types of protections to people in a home, it's even more critical that we do not think that the people living under the freeway should not receive the same types of protections from this environment. We have many laws that protect us from ourselves. With respect to criminalization, I hear a lot of people passionately uh, in fear of arrest. What I can tell you is that, at least in our neighborhood, if homelessness was actually um, followed through criminally, we would not have some of the problems that we have. We've been told and experienced directly that our police cannot afford to take themselves off of their route and do a ticket for any type of citation, take down a tent, spend six hours in paperwork for it because that takes them off the street. I understand everybody's concerned, but that's just not what's gonna happen. They're not going to want to arrest. Um, we have a problem. Our encampments in our neighborhood, I can't speak for others, but we've had advocates come to our neighborhood council to indicate that our encampments are actually now suffering from the services that we're providing them in that they are becoming entrenched in criminal activities uh, and more drug use. So in addition to mental health, this motion would need a drug component to it. And there are the rights of the other people in this neighborhood who are also being affected. I don't know what the answer is. This motion may not be it, but I, I beg the advocates to also recognize that, that the ADA component that people seem to think is not an issue the city was sued a couple of years ago for the sidewalks. They are working on it slowly. I am a pedestrian. I don't, I don't drive. I've done the homeless counts. I work with the homeless. There is an untenable aspect that's happening on the street. There is a accretion of possession of salvage, which is not personal possession, that is creating obstructions and also disease and fire hazard. We have had multiple fires on Bronson alone. We so we need to recognize that something needs to be done about removing people from under the overpass and probably Bonin's uh, motion is the better way to go, but it is a problem. Okay, um, next, Matt, Matt, go ahead. Um, so I, I did use a, a fair amount of time on um, the question. So I'll try to make my point um, relatively quickly. quickly. Um, so this entire thing is centered around the Martin v. Boise decision several years ago that prevented the city from forcing people to move off of the sidewalk by arresting them. The city just last year chose to appeal Martin v. Boise to the Ninth Circuit, defending the same law that Dennis called un unconstitutional. They lost ever since then. They've been trying to find their way around the ruling. Right now, this is playing out through this negotiated consent decree with Judge Carter. This motion is the latest attempt to do that and find a way to remove people from sidewalks and underpasses. It's a law specifically designed to criminalize because that's what has been the city's goal from the start. The city is tired of hearing from angry house people and desperately wants to appease their demands, which are basically lock up all the people on the streets. It's just the easiest thing to do. It's certainly easier than building 30,000 units of housing. To be completely honest, I don't believe the representatives in Buscaino's office are arguing and good faith when they talk about this being a mitigation measure like Sharp's disposal of porta potties what they don't mention is unlike those measures this law doesn't provide anything to help people it only helps people who hate being forced to look at these unfortunate people and the situation they're forced to live in and their argument that letting people take shelter under freeways is somehow enabling I find patronizing and infantilizing 
The line about ADA compliance is a joke. Just ask the request for sidewalk easements on Franklin I put in literally over a year ago. The reality is, despite what they're saying, this ordinance would certainly make nearly all the sidewalks in our city unlivable without criminal penalty. And the worst part is, despite all of the fantastical diversion scenarios that they're spinning about how intensive outreach and offering housing and having this great plan, there is no guarantee whatsoever that any of this will materialize if this motion passes. I feel like this council is being sold a bridge in New York and I don't think we should buy it. Instead, we should support the alternative motion by Mike Bonin and David Rue that actually attempts to make progress moving towards real solution and treats this issue like the humanitarian crisis it is. Despite the blame being shifted to the federal government, the Bonin Rue motion acknowledges the city's vast power. And of course, it almost goes without saying that the fact that we're having this discussion during a pandemic is absolutely ridiculous. So bottom line, I think the only uh, way forward if this council wants to write a CIS for something instead of against something is to write a CIS in favor of the Bon and Rue motion. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, Michael Connolly, go ahead, Michael. Wow, I'm next. Um, look, I, now that I don't have to ask a question, I can kind of pontificate a little bit. I, clearly, this is complicated. Um, I think that I think that sort of the folks that are really sort of railing against everybody, I don't hear a lot of solutions there. I just I just hear a railing against and not like how do we fix this other than you know the greater evil is you know not allowing somebody to just do whatever they want. Um, you know, I think that there's probably a solution. I think that the city's hands have been tied so greatly that this is kind of a back door to try and help people that can't help themselves. I know that's probably not a popular thought. I can only speak to up here. I can only speak to Bronson and Gower. Um, you know, it's, it's bad. It's really, really, really bad. And, you know, I don't think that the, the folks that that sort of live up here that have to sort of traverse those, you know, I, I, I take a lot of what Brandy says to heart because she, she does care. She studies these issues. She studies, she is on plum. She's, um, you know, I think she's, she's sort of stuck in the middle of this too of what to do. You know, I, I, I think that we're not listening to our constituents that actually live here that have to sort of walk up and down the street that don't have a, a you know, a way to get through there. I mean, look, I, I, I see faces on here sort of looking like I'm crazy. Walk down Gower, try and drive down Gower. Do it every day. It's, it's extremely dangerous, you know? Um, and, you know, that's, that's not safe for anybody. Like nobody wants anybody to die. Nobody wants anybody to get hit by a car. You know, it's, it's, it, is a, it is an untenable situation that a little bit of space, a little bit of breathing room for everybody would be helpful. I, I think there's a way to sort of, you know, meet in the middle on this. You know, again, I don't know if it's this, I don't know if it's this proposal from Buscayana's office. I think that, that Dennis and, sorry, and Gabriella, I don't think they're bullshitting us. I, I think they are in the middle of this. And, and watch the, watch this. The, well, What's the profanity? Okay, Sorry. I counsel everybody. But it wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't towards anyone. I apologize. But, you know, I think it's unfair to sort of say that, you know, they're kind of, they're on this dog and pony show. They were invited here and they're, you know, this is, you know, I, I think we need to sort of take a step back and take a breath and not demonize each other. Like we're all wanting the same thing. All of us. Like, I, I just think that, I, I don't know. Is is the is the I know that the cops that we have the slows up here. They're they're they don't want to arrest anybody. They want to keep everybody safe. That that's clearly their mandate. That's clearly their job. You know I I don't I don't, you know subscribe to anything else. Again, it's it's all up in this area. I know these officers well. I know the pressure and the strain that they're under. You know. I, I really wish, you know, I'm putting a lot on the outreach folks. Like, I really wish you'd sort of, you know, I'd love to sort of, what is something we could do together to help our homeless neighbors sort of like 
participate in this pro this program in this in this thing like look go down bronson you know it's it is you know there's lots of fires there's you know melting porta potties there's there's a real sort of you know distress situation and all of those people that live in those apartments can't really walk down without walking in the middle of bronson it's you know it's not a safe scenario at the moment okay you know, I, um that that's all i have to say okay I'm out. very good uh, Teresa, go ahead. Teresa, go ahead, Teresa. I think there's a couple issues that we need to focus on. First, like that this meeting specifically isn't yet to come up with solutions just to decide whether this motion is a solution and it's not. Um, secondly, I think we all have to focus like, yes, we all want the homeless situation figured out so we can walk down the street, but that's a want. The homeless people, homeless population need housing. Those are very different things. And I think we shouldn't be treating them the same. So I don't have a vote on this council motion today, but I would oppose the motion as it stands. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Fuzia, go ahead, Fuzia. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to also thank everyone who, who spoke today, uh, stakeholders and uh, uh, the guests as well, guest speakers. I think that um, everyone obviously wants the ultimate solution, which is being able to house all the people that are vulnerable right now in the streets. Now, I'm going to echo a little bit what Michael said earlier. I think that, you know, divisions and demonizing the other side is, this is not what, this is not what is going to bring a solution to this. And by the way, I don't think there is one solution. I think that there is a lot of solutions that are going to need, be needed on a long term period of time. A lot of decisions have to be made on a lot of issues in order to you know, it's all moving pieces, okay? So now talking about our neighborhood, I'm like, you know, many like Brandy, for example, I'm also a pedestrian. I haven't walked under the Garo Pass since two years because the last time I did, I was actually, you know, I, I was actually being put in danger. I'm not gonna go too further in this, but this is a real, I think that saying that there's no, issue of, of uh, at all of security for the neighbors is not right. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that, you know, we need to do everything we can to help a vulnerable, uh, the vulnerable uh, people in the streets. Okay, so let's make, make that sure that for me, I'd rather not walk that street and work on making, you know, making sure that we can facilitate whatever we can do to help those people. But at the same time, I think that my little problem of having to walk two blocks to go where I go is a lesser problem that people that are living under the past. So I want to make that very clear. However, I feel that this is not about finding a solution to homelessness. It's about finding a way to coexist better. That's the way that I see it. So how can we work together in order to, yes, making sure that the vulnerable population, we keep working on this issue. But at the same time, how can we also make our streets a little bit more safer and, and just to be more fair to everybody? So I've, I don't think we need to be enemies on this, not at all. I think we are all in this together. People who are in the streets are our neighbors as well. I, 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 this is my opinion as well. But I think that we should also listen to our stakeholders who, don't don't feel hurt you know what i mean that they're not feeling hurt because they cannot take their kids on some streets and stuff like that so i think that you know it's not about putting a band-aid or anything like that it's about being fair i don't think that putting people in jail because they refuse housing is a solution so i, I agree with the people who say that criminalizing is not a good thing I, I'm, I'm not for that at all uh but at the same time doing nothing by saying that is not solution, the ultimate solution, I don't think also that it, it helps. And I think that we can have a lot of stakeholders come around to help if we can give them a voice and not treating them as an enemy when they uh, mention the problems that they have when they want to you know, work in certain streets. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Andrew, go ahead, Andrew. It's your your chance. I'm not hearing a lot of support for this. Um, one thing that I do find disturbing that I wanted to bring up is, you know, 60, maybe 70% of the males that go through our social services end up on the street, end up mentally ill and drug addicted. This is our social services system. We have a lot of over micro focus on our police. A lot of them are good people trying to serve us, but yet we have some incredible blind faith in a system that is horrid, horrid. We are given children to take care of and they end up on the street and drug addicts. But yet this is the same system that a lot of my neighbors and a lot of people I hear over and over saying is gonna come in and solve these problems. They're not, we don't have the social services to solve these problems. We need to get a more honest reality about criminalizing things that we need to criminalize and increasing the services and really fixing our social services. We have been sending, sending social services out. It hasn't been working. And we're looking at a huge wave potentially of more mental illness and more homelessness. So I hope you guys can find it in your heart to take a deeper look at our actual social services, at our hospitals. I've worked at King Drew. I've worked for UCLA. I worked for four and a half years in, in SDD clinics and mental mental facilities trying to help people. It's not a good scene. So please educate yourself. Um, okay, so um, that's it for the for the board members with their hands up. Tom, did you have anything that you want to weigh in on? No, um, actually, um, Jim and, and now Andrew really kind of hit the nail on the head that I felt was somewhat lacking in our conversation about the need for services specifically for the um, mental, um, you know, mental illness issue and in the counseling there. So it's already been articulated from my point of view. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sheila, did you have anything? No, thank you. Okay, Robert, did you have anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll just, just remind folks, I know I was focused on the numbers earlier. And, and I think when it comes to you know, solutions to this problem, criminalization is is really a diversion from what works. I mean, housing and services works. Um, we just don't have enough of either one of those things. Could they be better? Yeah, but whenever you're providing services and you've got 28,000 people lined up outside waiting to get into your 15,000 shelter beds, uh, it makes it really difficult to be effective. And so I think that we have a choice here to support criminalization or we have a choice to reject it. And um, and you know, help focus our city's resources on providing support and services to folks who need them. Okay, very good. Uh, then uh, Bianca? Sure, um, I'll be quick too, since we've been here for a little bit. Um, I think just to kind of pull the threads that I'm hearing from all of our folks here, um, we all seem to agree that services are the better pathway for everyone. And this motion, this ordinance simply did not provide services. So I would encourage all of us to oppose this motion given our consensus and given our feedback on everything. And, oh, and then one other thing, um, Michael, when we think about meeting in the middle, I would just urge you to think about how the meeting in the middle, if we were to use this ordinance would require handcuffs on one side, which seems like a bit of an imbalance. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, that's it for, for everybody. I, and I'm still amazed we have 53 people uh, at this meeting. So um, I, I will show you what, um, Matt had sent me because this was his initial thing and I, I figured it would be better if we um, used this as, uh, he said, this is how we want to do it. Uh, this is referring to um, opposes, he says, the Hollywood United Neighborhood Council understands the desire of Judge Carter and his housed, re and its housed residents that its unhoused residents should no longer be forced to live under the Gower underpass. However, criminalizing people for doing so when there are no other desirable options is not a vi viable solution and is contrary to both Judge Carter's order and Martin versus Boise. Hunt therefore opposes the Blumenfield Cedillo amending motion to 20, 1376 and instead supports the alternative motion authored by Mike Bonin and David Rue. Um, I, I, I do want to say that I asked David Ruse uh, group or somebody in his office, several people, 
they did not come and they are they are our council members at least for for the moment so we tried to get somebody who supported this after that we tried to get uh somebody from bonin's office and they said they had the rule of not coming to other uh neighborhood councils uh, that are not in their area but for me at least i felt it was important that we try to get somebody who could speak to that amendment um and that amendment is certainly a lot does not um speak to um much of the issues with regards to uh ADA compliance and it's it's it specifies more on the um on the issues of of uh, services and and preventing homelessness um so the question is we can either uh I mean, it doesn't seem to be like there's a lot of support on the council for the, um, to support the, the Buscaino, um, uh motion or the, um, the uh, amendment to it, but there is numerous supports for the, um, for the uh, Rue, uh, Bon and Rue um, substitute motion. Um, is is does anybody want to speak to that george i feel i can't speak to the bon and rue motion because i haven't studied it nor have we even discussed that outside of it saying many people okay, so, that it's better so do you want me to bring it up even if you brought it up i need to study it it's not something that i'm just going to read well um, i mean it, it was on the on the agenda and we did have it uh, up there for for everybody to read, so that it it was there for for people to read. Well, the discussion um, tonight did not did not circle around the way the motion is written. With the final being, we oppose uh, the the first motion, but we are in support of the second motion. We haven't even discussed that second the second okay. motion of the bond um, group motion. Okay, so we can just, if that's the case, then we can just have a CIS uh, in opposition to uh, the, um, the Buscaino, uh, uh, I, I, I hate to, hate to. It, this is my know. opinion. I mean, George, I, you know, let the other board members speak. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's, 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 I mean, we could simply say, let's vote against um, you know, if that's what the board wants to do, is to not support the uh, Buscaino's motion, that's fine too. Um, Robert, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to second that. I think we should separate them. Okay, well, we have one, we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, I, I, I think we're gonna do one motion tonight. And uh, I, I don't know if we wanna create multiple motions on this. Um, Let's let's so then let it stand and let people vote. I guess as it stands, because that's what you put on the agenda. So, right, you know. Yeah, and it, and that's a good point. Although we did include the um, the substitute motion as you know as part of this. So, um, does does anybody want, else want to weigh in on that? I, I do, but I don't know how to raise my hand. I don't. What do I uh, raise? My, well, okay. Go ahead. I raise my hand. Good, Jim. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I, I, of course, I, I read all, I downloaded and read it during the, the, the press. I was kind of like Sheila, I didn't quite know what we were talking about. So uh, while this, since we've been here for you know, three hours, I, I read them. Uh, so I feel, I feel comfortable you know, opposing the first motion and proposing to, to support the substitute motion. But I would like to, add, if we were to do that, I would propose that we add to the, to what Matt put together, uh, something to the, to the, uh, uh, effect of saying, in addition, Hunt strongly supports the expansion of social services for the homeless population. Somehow to plug that in, because it's not in there anywhere, and it's not in the motions anywhere, but, but uh, I, I think it's, the, it's a major component of what's going on out there, uh, and it, it would help solve a lot of these problems and take a lot of them off the street also. So right, that'd be my two cents on, on the social services aspect. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any suggestions on, on that as well? 
Uh, Robert. So I would say briefly is that while we shouldn't not vote on something that was part of the agenda, I would just suggest that we oppose this motion altogether given the many concerns all of us on the board and also from the public have outlined tonight. Well, okay, so just, just to be clear, this was the council file number and there's a substitute motion attached to this file, which is all part of the, the file. So it's writing a, a, a community impact statement regarding this council file and there's a substitute motion on, on record there. So it is on the agenda if we want to support the substitute motion. Um, but if we just want to support, uh, to oppose the other, the, the, the initial motion, um, we can do that too and not follow up after that as well. Um, Robert, you have your hand up. Yeah, I would just, if I would have extra comments if we're gonna talk about, if we're including, I mean, I, I didn't see the text that Matt, that Matt had submitted until just during the meeting. And so if the motion, if we're gonna have a motion that's about rejecting one and supporting the other, I think we would need to discuss more about the substitute motion because we didn't discuss it. And it, it, while different, includes some other things that I would need to talk about. Um, okay, fair enough. Um, does, does, if that's the case, I mean, look, I, I just wanna make sure that we can, everybody can be uh, involved in this. Um, does, does somebody feel like we should, um, I mean, this, I guess the substitute George, motion should, yeah. George, why don't we just, yeah. George, why don't we just split it? There's two motions. There's a main motion and the substitute motion. Maybe we ought to just vote on the, the, the main motion and then have a separate vote on the substitute motion Make it clean. Um, yeah, I'm with oh. I'm with Jim because what, okay, you got to turn your sound yeah, down. Somebody else in the house watching. Uh, I would suggest because the only other way to do this. This is why I ask that everybody look at agendas and read the full CISs because the only other way to do this would then to be have a, another motion at full board where we've had several board members who are not there who are then got to catch up again. So I think Jim's method is the best way to go. Okay, so we would split it up into two motions uh, and then who uh, somebody else had their hand up as well. Okay. So we would split it up into two motions. So one would be the Hollywood United Neighborhood Council understands the desire of Judge Carter and his housed residents that it's unhoused residents and its housed residents that its unhoused residents should no longer be forced to live under areas like the Gower underpass. Uh, however, criminalizing people for doing so when there are no when there are no other desirable options is not a viable solution and is contrary to both Judge Carter's order and Martin versus Boise. Hunt therefore opposes the, and I would call it the uh, initial motion uh, for council file 20, 1376 and the amending motion to 20, 1376. It, does, does, does that sound right? Oh boy. <laughs> it sure is confusing. You're right. There's an amending motion. <laughs> yep. Yes, it is. I think so. <laughs> wow. George? Yes. Is there a Go ahead. Did you? Is there a way to type up what you just stated and put it on the screen? Yes, that's what I'm doing right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. So that's the case. Let me see if I can, let me just bring this up to the screen. A quick question for those of you who have read the Bonin and um, Rue motion. It, is there allowances for cleanup so that people can use the sidewalks, regardless of ADA? It, it doesn't even it doesn't even talk about the sidewalks. Yeah, it's, it's very general. It's yeah. it's all about services and and building 
you know, better opportunities and things like that. George, can you bring up the uh, second page of that motion after we finish voting on the first motion so that uh, so that Sheila can see it and everyone else is, it's actually only four paragraphs of the, what, what they're asking for. Uh, which, which, which one, which one are we talking about? The Bond and Rue motion. The, 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 yeah. The, when we finish the first motion, it might help to bring up the substitute motion second page, which is really okay. the, the first part yeah, is just especially why, why they want to do something, but the second page is what they're asking to do that might help. Well, so, yeah, that's fine. So we don't have, to have, to have another meeting on this. If the sanitation is not covered on that, we are told that we can request amendments to, to be put on that. So there could be some aspect put on there. Cool. For, for the bond um, motion, Brandy, or for the-, the In general, um, if we give a CIS, we are permitted to ask for other right. stuff. Okay. Um, that being said, can, can everybody see this motion that I have up here? I only see Matt's um, thing. Right, this is Matt's, this is one motion. This is the one we're gonna vote. This would be the first oh. one we would vote on. I thought Jim was suggesting, okay. I thought Jim was suggesting pulling up. The no, that was after, that's after we deal with the first motion then to bring up the details of the second motion so that Sheila can look at it rather than have us come back for another meeting on the second motion. Gotcha. Or the second, or excuse me, the, sec, the, the second, the substitute motion. Right. So, so this thing, uh, so does, does anybody have any questions about this or does anybody want to make any uh, comments about this motion here? Okay, does somebody want to make this motion? I'll make the motion. Okay, who's that? Bianca. Okay, Bianca makes the motion. I'll and, second it. And then Matt seconds it. Uh, this is motion and second from Matt. Okay, that being said, um, does it, anybody want to discuss this at all? Okay, let's 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 take a vote. Um, but George, don't making motions open it up again to public comment? Uh, no, we don't do it that way. But we we, we we run it through Rosenberg's rules of order and not through Robert's rules of order. That's that's our thing, and it's a much more streamlined kind of approach to it. But uh, if 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 you if you really feel like we should do this, then we're gonna have to open it up to everybody again. And then and, and I will give them all, uh, you know, 30 seconds. Is that what you want, Bianca? I'm asking what the rules are, George. I mean, the rules are that once we make the motion, we've discussed we discuss as the board and then we're done. We've already had public comment on on the, the presentation. If if you want, I mean Basically, Rosenberg's rules of order, order is whatever the chair wants to do. So if, if you really want to open up to get more public comment, and I, I personally don't think that any public comment on the motion as it stands here is going to be any different from what we've already heard before. But if you feel like that we should, then I will certainly, um, you know, give you credence and bring it to, to everybody. I mean, it's not my personal decision. This is a democratic and very, you know, open for interpretation board, but I just wanted to have us, I guess, as board members, keep that in mind then, given what you're saying, given the public comments we've heard and those opinions of our stakeholders, we should keep that in mind as we vote on this motion. <laughs> That's I right. Guess, That's right. I, interpretation of this. We have it on the agenda. It is the agenda item. Uh, we've had multiple people in the, in the comments part talk about the alternative option we don't need to go back through that process okay very good i i think that's true too i think um uh it's a it's a pretty straightforward motion does um let's uh let's get over to the vote okay the first vote would be let's see. um okay so andrew George, okay. George, 
Yes. Why don't you just clarify for everybody that a yes is that we are, are opposing. Okay, very good. Let's clarify. Right. The so, yes approves so they, this motion. Yeah, a yes approves this motion and the motion is against the, um, the, uh, the, the initial council file motion and the amendment and, and the uh, amendment of that motion. Is there anybody who doesn't have any, who has any questions about that? Okay, Andrew. Jane. Uh, you abstain? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bianca. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Fuzia. Abstain. Okay, you abstain. George, I, I, I abstain too. Um, Jim. Yes. You miss it. You're not. Jim, yes. Uh, uh, George, I yes? think he's. I think he skipped me. Who, who, who's, who's me? Brandy. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, oh, you're right, Brandy. I'm sorry, Brandy. Yes. Okay, sorry. I'm forgive okay. me. No worries. Um, uh, Jim, Luis is out. Uh, Matt. Yes. Uh, Tom? Yes. Uh, Sheila? Abstain. Abstain. Um, uh, Robert? Yes. Okay. Um, Jim is a yes. Uh, Michael? Abstain. Abstain. Let's see. I get everybody, me, Tom, Sheila, Andrew, Brandy, Fuzia. Did I get Fuzia? She abstained, right? Yeah. Um, okay, yes, so so it, it, it passes barely. Um, Did you get Erin? Is Erin out? Erin's out. She, she left. So we have one, two, three. We have. One, two, three. I, I think four. we have. Ten. What's that? I think we have ten, but I'm not sure. Because Teresa yeah, can't. We, we have eleven. We have technically yeah. eleven. Right. Well, hold on. Give give me one second. Let me. Uh, there's a there's a problem with this vote sheet here. Give me a second to fix this. I get ten here. Eleven. I get 11. 11 that can vote or 10 that can vote? We need 10. We have 11. We have, we have 11 who can vote. Uh, Agree. Okay, so we have Andrew's abstain, Bianca's yes, Brandy is yes. Um, Fuzi abstain, I'm abstain, Jim is yes, uh, Matt is yes, Michael is abstain, Sheila, you abstain, correct? Correct. Okay. Tom is yes. Um, okay, so we, we have five. Um, yeah, it looks like we have five to approve this. Uh, one, two, 
Ranka, Brandy, Jim, Matt, and Tom. And then. Uh, and Rob, did Robert vote yes? And, oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. And Robert, right. Okay, so we have six. So six, so it passes the CIS. Okay, so the next one we want to do is to uh, look at the substitute motion. And let me bring that up. Hold on. Uh, George, what would be the purpose of the substitute motion? Because your your motion, this motion that was on the table, it passed supporting the Bon and Rue motion. So no, no, it passed uh, opposing the Buscaino motion and the Blumenfield Cedillo amending motion. No, it's if you read it, the Hunk therefore opposes the initial motion for motion and the oh, it opposes both of them. Opposes the Blumenfield Cedillo. There's there was an amending motion to the Buscaino motion. Oh, got, it, got, it, got it, got it, got it. I understand. And and then there's a substitute motion from for Rue, which I was going to bring up now. So and let me see if I can bring that up. I think this is it here. Uh, and this one. So so let me see if we can. If everybody can. can so this is how he moves for the city council to instruct the city attorney to detail what steps would be taken and by which agency body or person to begin commandeering hotels, motels for use as homeless housing and report back to the council within 10 days. Move that the city council direct the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority and in consultation with the city administrative officer to develop a plan for a significant expansion of encampments to homes programs coupled with the significantly scaled up City of Los Angeles master leasing program. Such programs could use a coordinated concentrated services based approach to rapidly house residents of an entire encampment simultaneously, though readily available through readily available master lease units. The report should include cost and staffing estimates and consider federal grants, COVID relief funds, state and county assistance and reprogramming from other, other efforts that do not result in the rapid housing of unofficial individuals. I further move that the city council request that the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority detail within 10 days what is prohibiting the development and use of broadly accessible app of a broadly accessible app that would provide real time information on available housing and shelter beds and to how to ex access them and detail resources required to develop it and make it available. I further move that the city council request that the U.S. District Judge David O. Carter facilitate a settlement agreement between the city of Los Angeles, County of Los Angeles, unhoused residents and their advocates, advocates, the Alliance for Human Rights and other parties as appropriate, similar to the settlement agreement he brokered in Orange County Catholic Worker at All versus Orange County, City of Costa Mesa, City of Anaheim, and City of Orange, which led to the housing of thousands of unhoused residents and left public rights of way free of encampments without a single arrest. So that's what the Rue, Bon and Rue uh, substitute motion is. Um, does, does anybody want to speak to that or should we make a motion on that? Andrew. Yeah, the commandeering hotels, whenever the government starts taking private businesses to solve problems they can't solve and tries to run them, doesn't have a good history. It's too far for me. Okay, very good. Anybody else have any comments on that? I would just add something, you know, the, the common that I spoke of wasn't handcuffs, Bianca. It was, you know, safety and cleanup. Like, you know, th this doesn't address that at all. I, I think something about that needs to be put in here. Okay. What, uh, what would you want to put, would you, what would you want to put in there? You know, whatever the, whatever the rule is, what is it? A two week notice? Helpful to you, but I'd also like a puppy. That comes second. That wasn't me. <laughs> that was that was Siri talking. What the heck? <laughs> um, you know, whatever the sort of current rule is, two week notice to sort of keep keep it. You know, 
compliant and clean. And for both the people that live there, you know, I, I'm assuming if you live there, you want your trash picked up. It's either hands off or aggressive. Like, you know, there's gotta be a, a sort of happy medium in that respect where, you know, a two week notice to sort of, you know, clean up and everybody participates and it's not moving people. It's just, it's just keeping things clean and orderly so that, you know, both the people that live in the neighborhood and live in the encampments have sort of a, a, a feasible place to, to live and walk and sort of share the neighborhood a little bit. So did you want to, um, but I understand that, but how, how, would, how would you want to word this additional thing? Well, I, so, let me start with, I would, I would agree with Andrew. I would take out the commandeering of private buildings. Like that sounds very, you know, draconian okay, to so, me. Okay, so, we, um, so Robert has his hand up and Andrew has his hand up here. Jim, let's let Robert speak, sure. then Andrew, and then Jim, okay? So Robert, go ahead. Yep, so basically there's, I'll just make quick comments about each of the four paragraphs. One, I mean, I, I would support commentary hotels and motels because we need more, we need more interim housing. But uh, the second part of it is about a specific encampments to home programs. I think there's a lot of problems with this program and also changing up the way we're prioritizing services. And without a commitment from lost from the city to increase funding instead of reallocate funding, that just changing the way we're prioritizing homeless services and, and housing for homeless people doesn't make a lot of sense. And also increase re, it, it takes all of the work that people have been doing and basically breaks all of the promises to the people that are currently waiting for housing right now um, to prioritize new people. And it's just a problem of re-traumatizing people and, and destroying trust with the system. The third paragraph is about an app that's availability. They want LASA to, to do a whole research project on an app in the next 10 days that would tell about what available housing and shelter beds while LASA already has that information. And, you know, we're trying to house people in the middle of a pandemic. So it's a waste of time. And then finally, the fourth part is about uh, this agreement with the judge, David Carter, which again is a, a non-democratic process for solving homelessness. And so I don't support, you know, asking this settlement to move forward without a democratic process. Those are my Okay, comments. okay, very good. Uh, Andrew, go ahead. Uh, I guess just to clarify, taking away people's uh, businesses reduces our freedom. It reduces um, our ability to make money and function as a country. Um, and the, but the further point, probably the more important point that I was trying to make was history is very clear in showing that when you take things from the private sector, from people who have worked hard and built them and know how to function them and you move them into being run by the government, normally it fails. So okay. that, that, that's why I think it's a, it's a terrible idea. Okay. Um, Jim and then Bianca. Well, no, all, all I was going to suggest is take commandeering out, maybe just put securing. Because securing would, would mean everything from negotiating with the owners with some kind of a financial package that, that rewards them for, uh, for this being used rather than being uh, taken over by a, uh, you know, imminent domain. I think I agree commandeering is a little strong. I think, I think securing might, might be a better one. And I, and I would I still would want to add that we would hung strongly supports expansion of social services for the homeless prop population because still not in here, which just sort of alludes to it, but we need to, we need to keep pounding away at that. Cause that's, I think that's the center of this whole problem or our part okay. of it. Okay, uh, Bianca. Um, Jim took the words out of my mouth, commandeering, paying people money to use their business for this public good. I think those are both kind of things that we can all rally on. Um, and I think also when we consider commandeering or as you were saying, taking private property or taking a private business, we might also extend that courtesy to our unhoused neighbors and not take their private property in these ideas of sweeps and clearing the sidewalk. So we should all be careful of that. Uh, okay, Brandy. Yeah, there has to be, the thing is that a tremendous amount of the private property that is now being considered to be homeless, it was not their private property. 
uh, that's why we need to do something about going back to some of the cleanups because what's happening is an accretion of bulk dump, uh, couches, sofas, cabinets, et cetera, that are uh, not private possession that are being used to create a larger and larger footprint. So when the bulk dumps, when the, when the cleans went back into effect, that doesn't happen. And many of those items, by the way, are also not clean and uh, harbor disease as well as vermin. Uh, so I support Michael's suggestion that some aspect of a bulk of, of the return of the um, bulk cleanings after the CDC permits us to do it need to go back into effect. Okay, so, but that's nowhere in, in this, uh, in any of these motions. I don't see it there. Is, is there, is, is, am I missing something oh, there? The street clean aspect, I believe, was in the first motion. The sanitation aspect was in the first one, if I recall correctly, but I've got to go back through it right now. Okay. Do we have any other comments? You could offer that like a lot of motels in the city are also not that clean and also harbor disease if we're gonna. <laughs> but the ones that participate in Project Room Key don't, are held to a higher standard. So it's a different thing. We're not saying you use the flea bag motel. The properties that have been utilized in the service have not fallen under that group. The, the difference is Bianca is that the streets are all of ours, right? Though that isn't private property. That's, that's, we all are entitled to those streets. You know, right. We were all I ask is that, you know, we all, you know, can use the streets equally, you know, like you can sleep there. I don't, I don't, I actually don't care if you sleep there. Just, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, block it for everybody else. And come on, you've been on Bronson. It's, I think, you know, there, there, it's one thing to sort of, you know, rally around civil liberties and personal rights, but like, it, it's gotta, it's gotta be for everybody. It's gotta be for the good of the community, not just one aspect of the community. And the other thing that I would argue about this is like, I would want, you know, sort of the, the really bad garbage that's in my home taken out. I do it every week. I would assume they would like that every week. You know, I, I don't think people want to live just in their own, you know, refuse. I, I don't think that's fair to anybody. Well, actually in Michael, it's not their own refuse. Unfortunately, too many housed people not caring about the homeless have decided that because homeless are living there, they're the ones dumping their trash in technically somebody else's front yard. So that's part of the reason that this needs to stop. Okay, does somebody want to uh, vocalize what it is that you want to change in terms of the, um, with regards to the, the cleanup stuff? Can I get some language on this? Sheila, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to in my own head write it. So I'd say I'm going to think out loud here. Sure. The, the, the critical issue that I've heard tonight from, from uh, many people, including some of my own uh, neighbors that are in area one, the homeowners that I represent, the, their concern is that they are not, they don't have the space to walk down the sidewalk anymore. So pl places have basically become un unwalkable and that goes against the ADA decision. And that goes against just what sidewalks were designed for, which was for pedestrian access. So that, and to a degree, this motion is a long-term. So all this is just basically let's expedite providing services and providing housing, but still there will be an interim. So can we say something in the interim between um, today and the day when we have enough housing for the homeless that sidewalks need to have accessibility, the three foot uh, width accessibility for disabled and pedestrians as they were intended and that garbage must be picked up uh, weekly at all in encampments. So, uh, side, so sidewalks must be maintained for the disabled and pedestrian access. For, how about for ADA compliance? Okay. And at minimum uh, for ADA compliance. Okay. And um, 
sanitation services need to be provided as they are to all residential. Well, so of course we pay for it, you know, in our utility bill. That's um, a, but that's Sheila, that's, that's the point. It's like, and I think that gets to Bianca is that they are they are people who should live in an environment that is as clean as, as possible. But we well, and, sanit and, san and sanit sanitation should service these routinely uh, service. Er these these areas regularly. Yeah, fine. But Brandy, okay. my, my point is we get a trash pickup because we pay for it. It's in our what? DW bill, you know. I'm just saying when people think that we're advocating for trash as a as a detriment, it's because I believe that anybody who has to live there, most of us get to throw our trash away in a bin. Right. I, well, well, they I'm have bins. Trash. They're overflowing. Yeah, I get it. Okay. 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 So, so this is what we have then. And, and let me, let me, uh, I might add Does Matt anybody, up, stand up if we want to add in all comments first, maybe. Is that helpful? Yeah. 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 What, yeah. Go ahead. Whatever. Does anybody have any more comments on that? Matt has his hand up. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Matt, go ahead, Matt. I, I just want to say that adding language about <laughs> Clients, I think, like, just kind of veers us into thorny territory because that's kind of part of the issue that we've been discussing. We don't really have uh, a good way of discussing ADA compliance without this exact kind of motion that we just voted to oppose. Then I, I just, I, I wouldn't support it with that language. And you know, I, I want to be clear that obviously I support. Um, people with disabilities and, and ADA compliance, but I, I just think the context of the CIS, I, I don't know if that's the right place for it, and I don't know if I would support it with that language because there's a lot of open questions to that. Okay, does but, anybody else uh, Matt, have any the comment? the only on way that? we're going to get yeah, my comment response to Matt is in order to reach ADA compliance, you have to start picking up the the bulky items and the garbage. That's what's taking up a lot of the room, plus the five people tents, you know, that some some of them are now putting on the ground instead of a one person tent. So that takes up a lot of room too. So there has to be some kind of legislation to minimize the negative impact they have on the disabled and pedestrians. So I guess I'll just respond to that quickly. Um, you know, in response to the five person tents, often those tents are multiple people occupancy. There are people who have families or uh, tend to stick together, share space or share possessions in those tents. And I agree with you. Um, I would love to see a lot more garbage collection in the encampments. You know, the, the, what I see, there's a, there's a city trash can right by my apartment um, next to the encampment. And the city only empties it once a week at most. So I agree that, you know, the city should be providing more services. But I, I guess my point is that adding this kind of language to the CIS kind of veers it off from the course. And I, I think we should have a discussion about this issue because it's valid. But I just I feel like it's too big of a discussion for this particular motion. Well, this is these are our two motions. I mean, we we said yes well, to getting rid of I mean, the, the other one, and we you know the, it's still, the issue still exists. I mean, look. The other thing I might add is that we have a contingency of people that, whether we believe it or not, felt uncomfortable coming to this meeting because they felt that since their opinion uh, was unpopular uh, but valid to them, that we need to figure out a way to, for, to compromise with that group who feels like we're, we're failing them. We've got I people- I second that, open. Brandy. I, I want to reiterate, I have heard from many residents that are uncomfortable speaking up because some of the language that was spoken by the people who opposed the first motion, it, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. It, it's, it's, there's vitriol there and there doesn't need to be. You know, This is a discussion. This, this right. is a way okay. to find a compromise. Okay, so we have uh, Andrew, then Bianca, and then Robert. So Andrew? The ADA thing, I understand what you're saying in a way, Matt, um, but you know, all of our, like almost every business on Franklin was just sued for ADA and the city of Los Angeles is sued for ADA. 
and we've had people tonight talking about how many people that are unhoused have have disability issues, so they would need that space too. And it does equate the same space that you would need to walk. So I, I don't know, you're, it just sounds like you're opposing things based on some hierarchy of your belief structure instead of the world that you're dealing with and the laws that we're dealing with. Um, okay, then we have Bianca and then Robert. Yeah, I just briefly want to quickly push back against, and while well, and very respectfully do so in light of what you were saying, Sheila and Brandy, is that I understand that there are different opinions on this topic, but also it's uncomfortable to in public and we're on Zooms, mind you, not even in real life. And so I think people have to push past that uncomfort to speak their opinions, especially on topics as important as this. You could also email us. There's different avenues of speaking their mind. The fact that people are not vocalizing this to us as board members should be taken into account when we consider these motions. No, they what I said was, what I said was they didn't come to the meeting. They've absolutely vocalized those things in writing, on Facebook, on Nextdoor, uh, in other committees. Last year, we had multiple committee meetings of, of people who tried to push against a 500 foot rule or four. So I'm just saying they didn't come to this meeting and they shouldn't be ignored because they didn't come to this meeting. But I think they have an obligation to come to these meetings where we're voting on these things. That's what but we, we hear from them. Uh, okay, okay, look, look, it's Robert's turn. And then uh, let's, let's figure, let's move on this because either we're gonna move on this, or we're not gonna move on this, but it is 10 o'clock now. So Robert, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously the passability of the sidewalk is a real concern and a real issue, no, no doubt. And I think that the concern though is just moving. I mean, if we talk about it as moving towards enforcement, that's obviously the conversation we've been having all night. I think that we heard a great idea from the streets, not the streets, uh, services, not sweeps people tonight. And they talked about teams of people who are unhoused going out to encampments and helping them clean up encampments. We've we've, we have know about the lack of sanitation services that are provided to encampments. I think that the answer here is to provide more services and education to encampments, to the people living there so that the bends that are overflowing get emptied, that you know, there are people coming and letting them know like this is, these are the concerns that your neighbors are having. And that, that, that is the, the way forward to a solution that doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to include you know, tickets and fines and policing in that regard. Um, and we haven't tried it. I mean, we don't have enough sanitation services for encampments. We don't have inclusion of people who live in encampments in these decisions. So. You know, the, that's just my two cents. I think that we should reject this motion with whatever comments we want to make as to what the city's focus actually should be. Okay, so let me just show you what the what we currently have so that everybody can can see that. And it is, uh, let me see if I can bring it up a little bit clearer, um, which is Hunk supports uh, the, excuse me, the alternative motion to, uh, 201376, authored by Mark, Mike Bone and, and David Rue. But in addition, Hunk supports a significant expansion to social services for the homeless population. So this does speak to what you're saying, Robert, is that Hunk says we want a exp significant expansion to social services. In the interim, while housing is being constructed, sidewalks must be maintained at minimum for ADA compliance and sanitation should be should service these areas regularly. Is 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 that something that we we can't support? I mean, I actually think this is a this is one of those uh, things where, as much as I uh, appreciate the plight of the homeless, it is unfair for a lot of people that they're able to take over these sidewalks, whether it is Gower or, or, or Argyle and such, and and it and it's, it ceases to become part of the public right through way right of way and that's that's really not not fair to to the rest of, of of the city who perhaps need to use it there are very dangerous times when people are forced to walk into the street on gower and such because there is no way to get through i think that is clear and for us to simply say that we would like to have the sidewalks be maintained at a minimum for ada compliance is just saying we would like our, 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 our sidewalks to be following the law as we would expect uh, other 
uh, areas be following the law. I mean, this is why we have curb cutouts of, uh, and, 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 and things for, for wheelchair accessibility on sidewalks and such. Um, so is, is that, if that's the case, that, that this, is that the case for, for Robert and Matt and Bianca that you can't um, support this, the addition of that, you can't support this if it includes the addition of that? If that's the case, could you modify it to a way that could be supported? Um, I, I, I wouldn't support it in its current form. I would just uh, delete the part sidewalks must be maintained at minimum for ADA compliance. Again, not that I don't support people with disabilities in ADA compliance. I just think that that one phrase introduces a whole host of issues that I don't think we've fully grappled with uh, in this meeting. And, you know, I certainly am not trying to extend this meeting any longer, but that would be, if, if you're asking me, George, what it would take for me to support it, that would be it. Okay, so you would say if you, what if, it, what if you modified it to say, uh, and the city should investigate ways to, to uh, uh, allow, to, to uh, have the sidewalks be maintained for a minimum of ADA compliance. I, I mean, look, there's a rule in place that gives the the, the space. Like that's all yeah. we're saying. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, there, there is no, they've already investigated it. it that's okay. already done. I mean, okay. I, I feel like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth if we we're okay with one group of people. Yeah. And not the other. Group. Uh, yeah, I, it just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. George, okay. I, I move. I move to support this. I move to support this motion as written, as you just stated. With so, with, so, with the. Um, so Sheila makes the motion. Yeah, we need to move on. Second. I, uh, I second the motion. Okay, oh. so Tom seconds it. Uh, did, oh, got a question. Okay, discussion. Yes, Jim. I mean Jim. Then Andrew. Okay. And anybody else? I I, I, I was. I would suggest uh, that we add to it that we uh, that instead of begin com commandeering hotels, that uh, Hunk feels that securing okay. hotels and motels would be better language. So I think we can take um, command okay, commandeering so, 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 out. Um, Jim, how do you feel about incentivize? That'd be fine because that, that's what I'm that's what I'm getting at. I mean, if you can make it worth their while financially. Uh, that's why securing it, you can negotiate and work out a deal and a contract. I think the word securing is almost as strong and potentially offensive as commandeering, quite frankly. I like incentivizing. Okay, that's about, fine with that. About, that's cool. How, how about securing through incentive? There you go. There we go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> So, so we we're saying that. So, in that case, what he's saying is um, uh, hotels and motels uh, language um, should be changed to say. Uh, the securing of hotels and motel, uh, the securing through incentive is through incentives. No, George, not securing, procuring. Pro procuring through incentives, uh, procuring of hotels. Teresa, wake up. And and motels. Let's take hotels to house. Mm -hmm. Through incentives. Is that is that correct? Language. Yeah. In the first paragraph. Uh, the first. I just language should be changed to say the procuring of hotels and motels through incentives. Is that correct? Okay, so Hunt supports the alternative motion to 20-1376 authored by Mike Bonin and David Rue. But in addition, Hunk supports a significant expansion to social services for the homeless population. Language should be changed to say the pure procuring of hotels and motels through incentives 
instead of commandeering uh, just just a note i was just reading on google about the legal semantics of commandeering commandeering does include you you pay for service you it's not like you take it over for free so you do you have to make payment and it is constitutional so uh, George, I, I, I take out the but in front of in, in addition, but sort of waters it down. I just say in addition, uh, right after David Rue. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I just okay. take, out, take out the but. Right. That seems in addition, tenuous. you're right. Okay, in addition, <laughs> sure. Um, uh, so, Andrew, did you have anything more? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Given Sheila's feedback, would we not be then okay with commandeering since that is effectively what we're saying? Um, I just want to, I want to see the legal definition of the word commandeering, you know, as, as it relates to hotels. And so I was reading a quick article that was done by, uh, what is it? This UC Berkeley professor, Erwin Shermansky or whatever. And so it does look like, yeah, that they're basically, you take over a property, but you do have to financially compensate them. It doesn't say at fair market value, et cetera. It didn't get into that level of detail, so. So isn't our sentence then a bit redundant? No, it, because it didn't get into fair market value to me, you, you know. But our sentence also doesn't say that. Yeah, you're right. right. Well, well, it says that we're doing an incentive versus, you know, if, if I showed up at your house and I said, I'm taking your house, here's the offer, versus I showed up at your house and said, I really need to use your house, let's work out an incentive program that makes sense for you. You know, until someone takes your house away, I don't think you really understand this. But that, that's what we're talking about is someone taking someone's business or commandeering their house and saying, you have to go somewhere else you can't run your business here anymore. That's how you've made money. You've invested your whole life in doing this. Maybe your parents have invested their whole life in doing this, but because us as a government, as a community, haven't been able to solve our problems, we've decided to take what you've built and use it for our social <laughs> services. Okay, oh, just come on. So, by the way, so, okay. I want to point out that- okay, hold, 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 hold on, okay. So Bianca, then Brandy, and then anybody else want to change this? Because I think we got to move on this. My entire Bianca? point of what I was saying was that the definition of commandeering per Sheila includes incentives. So it just seems like this is a redundant sentence. Um, it's not yeah. well defined enough. Uh, so yeah, um, I, I think we, we don't lose, we don't lose, lose. Out, so. we don't lose anything by leaving it in like this. I mean, can I just clarify one more thing? The, the reason that this was put in is because several hotels that had been given government assistance over time, either CRA, CRA dollars, et cetera, or tax credit, had not enlisted in Project Room Key as they, I, you know, as many of us thought they should. And so that's why this language was then said, okay, you didn't, you didn't voluntarily step up to the plate, so now we're going to force you to. So that's the the genesis of this language. Yeah, and the um, okay. Seems like a very Brandy, Br hold on. Let's let's let Brandy let's let Brandy talk because she has, she was she's been trying to talk. The other thing that is people don't realize. I don't have to remember in the early two thousands. You have to remember that eminent domain works two ways. When you engage in eminent domain one way, just because you think it's of a social benefit. In the early two thousands, the city engaged in eminent domain to take away most of the small businesses on Hollywood Boulevard to make uh, developments and hotels because they felt that it was a way to benefit the city. You cannot, you have to recognize that when you permit eminent domain in one way, you can permit it in another way and it's, it never works out well. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, the Florentine Gardens, they wanted to take Florentine Gardens uh, for the fire department and they were uh, knocked out by a lawsuit and, and, and talked to anybody about it. They said, yeah, it's really hard to do that. So um, anyways, so does anybody else want to, uh, this, is the, this is the motion that we have now um, with the, the included language. Does anybody else want to make any additional comments on this or maybe make a suggestion for changes or revisions? Okay, so let's let's take the uh, vote for this then. So we have Sheila has 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 motion for it, and 
Um, Thomas seconded it. Andrew? Tom seconded. Yeah. yeah, Tom seconded. Andrew is yes. Uh, Bianca? No. No. Uh, Brandy? Yes. Um, Fuzia? Yes. Uh, George? Yes. Uh, Jim? Yes. Uh, Matt? No. Um, uh, Michael? Michael? All right, sorry, yes. Okay, yes. Um, uh, Robert? No. Um, Sheila? Yes. Okay. And Tom. Yes. Okay. So the second one goes through with those provisions. Okay. Um, that being said, I'm going to stop this share here. Uh, um, I think it was Kendall that said she wanted to, we, we forgot to do public comment. So I am going to do public comment now. Um, Glennis, you have a public comment for two minutes. You can't do public comment after you take a vote. You should have done public comment before you did a vote. Uh, and also, like, there was a pointless correction. No, this is public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, all right, but you did a second motion and uh, literally didn't take public comment for that. So that's screwy. But um, uh, it's... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just, like, really uncomfortable right now. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I don't know, it was a pointless correction. Y'all need to stop, uh, trying to sweep the homeless. Um, and we already tried to, um, incentivize hotel through project group key. I think, you know, one of y'all had a good point, um, with that and, um, it failed. It just completely failed. Um, and so it, it's really, it's, uh, it's just, yeah, and, and y'all should have really had public comment for the motion. Um, this general public comment is useless. <laughs> y'all okay. aren't really listening to us. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, then um, Charlie X, public comment on items not on the agenda. Oh, Sophie Bridges, public comment for items not on the agenda. Hi, yeah, um, I just wanted to echo the previous speaker. I am disappointed that this motion was passed through without public comment, I think that's appropriate, but I do wanna say a huge shout out to the members of this council um, who brought up really thoughtful points throughout this conversation. I really appreciate the point that Bianca made about um, kind of talking about private property when it comes to hotels and motels and then not taking into consideration the private property of our unhoused neighbors. I think that's a that's really, really essential. And I, I think if there's anything that I'm disappointed about tonight, that's the thing that I'm most disappointed about is um, prioritizing the private property of hotels and motels over our unhoused neighbors. Um, but yeah, I just, I wanna convey my appreciation and just say, you know, the people who are on the call tonight, there was a comment earlier about how the vitriol makes people uncomfortable. But I mean, these are, we are all people who are here, we're advocating, we're here and, and we spent the hours to be on this call tonight too. Um, we are we are people in the neighborhood, we are people in Los Angeles and um, and we're just here to stick up for what's right. So I, I, I really would urge you to not see this as vitriol. It's not vitriol. This is just people who really want to see the best for our community. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, Caleb, two minutes um, for items not on the agenda. Um, yeah. Uh, God, where to begin? What an evening. Um, I guess thank you to some of the council members who clearly recognize that this is something that we need to approach with care. And I would also just really encourage you all to 
probably look over how you're supposed to go about different things. I mean, you just basically amended a motion. You didn't take public comment. Now you're taking public comment after. It's not on the agenda. You had multiple instances throughout the evening. You had someone give a presentation. It wasn't agendized. That's a violation. All sorts of things. Um, yeah, I mean, just just do better, honestly. I mean, I know that some of you are really trying, but like, keep reading, keep educating yourselves. You didn't even look at motions that you were considering tonight. I heard multiple people on this body say they hadn't even read over documents that you should be having a discourse about. That's highly unprofessional. And frankly, it was like, it's just a little bit mind blowing. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm done. Um, okay. Um... Danielle. Hi, um, I wanted to thank you all for opposing the original ordinance. I'm really glad that that horrible criminalization motion did not go through. Um, to the uh, board member, Andrew, who mansplained what a business is, I would recommend that you uh, understand that we know what a business is and we're kind of more concerned with people's livelihoods or lives than we are with the people who um, own a hotel. Most hotels are like giant corporations anyways. Um, I think that they have plenty of empty rooms. That's been the entire, that was the entire point of Project Room Key. There are tons and tons and tons of empty rooms. So our entire question was that we could just have people who are living on the streets and who are apparently, you know, in your guys's way on the sidewalk, just stay in the empty rooms. Um, so we understand that that sounds scary, but it's really just about letting people have beds and letting people have shelter. Um, so I think your concern was a little bit concerning to me. Thanks. Okay. Um, Kendall, go ahead, Kendall. Hi, um, thank you for opening it back up to public comments uh, after voting on a motion that was heavily discussed and modified. Uh, I'd like to echo the sentiment that this is kind of not in keeping with uh, how uh, how these kinds of things should be run. Um, I am, but I am glad to have an opportunity to speak because I am sort of horrified at some of the things that I've heard uh, said during this discussion. Um, specifically, the way that a couple of board members have been incredibly disrespectful to the people who came to this board meeting to give testimony about the work that they do. Uh, providing social services to our unhoused community members. Uh, and I am a stakeholder in Hollywood. Uh, I have lived in CD13 my entire adult life and I work in Hollywood in your district. Um, I can't believe what Michael and Andrew were saying about the people who provide social services here. Um, really incredible. Um, and I just wanna remind everybody that I believe Andrew, you are the owner of Bourgeois Pig, right? You were tweeting earlier in this uh, pandemic about how uh, you're an anti-masker. You don't think people should be using masks. Um, very cool uh, to see you expressing your libertarian sentiments on this board about how you don't understand what the term commandeering means uh, and how we have to protect massive multinational conglomerates. Uh, in order to help you protect your business somehow. These are the same things uh, I don't understand. Um, please, please, please educate yourselves about what you are speaking on, Sheila. I can't believe you didn't actually read the, the proposed agenda items, the motions. City council meetings are public. If you were attending public city council meetings and watching, you would know that Joe Buscaino's staff members came to this meeting and lied to you, lied to you about his public record. He voted against an eviction moratorium and his staff members lied to you. That should be very telling to you about whether or not to trust them when they come to you asking you to pitch something on their behalf to the city council. Please, please do your homework. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jamie Penn. How do I even follow that? Um, not just to echo the sentence, it's just really weird procedure to have such a heavily modified agenda item that you then allow public input on when the public wants to give its input before. I mean, people value transparency and that's, that's you know, typically the reason for these proceedings. And I just don't understand why, you know, the comments that were made about, about valuing private property and, and, and caring so much about property, but, and, yet, and then yet the, the insinuation you're making about the, 
sidewalks need to be clear and clean. That's the, the result of that is the destruction of property. I mean, it's, it's the one in this, I mean, these are your neighbors. So I don't understand why you're not also seeing that as, you know, a, a breach of civil liberties. That's exactly what that is. And I, I yeah, of course, I mean, the, it, it, I didn't know that this was a local business owner either, but that absolutely makes sense because you seem to be speaking only from your viewpoint, not from that of your constituents, which who have been giving you their input for a long while. So I just, I would hope that you would, take some of this into consideration. Your seats are up for elections soon. The whole election cycle is going to happen. And uh, yeah, that's my input. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Cadillac Z. Oh, can you stop? George, can you stop? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Like I said before, this is my um, very first NC meeting. So I'm just a doe-eyed babe in the woods. but. Uh, I think it's pretty rad that um, six of you were on the right side of history and actually listened to the public input. And um, on that point, the five of you who abstained, I'm kind of wondering why you even bother being on this neighborhood council. If you don't want to take a position, why are you all even doing this? Why not just stick to whining on Facebook and fast door comment sections? And by the way, that whole thing about, oh, they were afraid to come here. They could only comment on next door. Oh, God, the poor souls. This is my first meeting. I didn't have any problem making a comment here. I'm sure those people love to spew vitriol on Fast Door and Fast Book. So, you know, they can show up and, and give their opinion like a grown up and, and, and not just whine to sympathetic members of this board. So again, I'd like to reiterate, thank you to those who stood for the right thing today and opposed this grotesque motion. And to the rest of you guys, grow up. I yield my time. Okay, uh, we, have, we have, hello? 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 Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I just, I wish that you guys had opened it up for public comment before you voted on it, because I just wanted to mention that while the state allows um, explicitly for the commandeering of private property um, in emergencies such as COVID-19, um, the California government code explicitly requires the state to pay for any property that is commandeered. Um, that's government code section 8572. Um, and the executive order that applies is N-2520. So I just thought that you would probably wanna know that before voting because the, all the hand wringing about having to pay for it, that's actually already state law. That's all. Thank you. Um, Alex. Hi, um, three quick things. On the subject of ADA compliance, again, I just like to actually preface this by saying I'm a homeowner in this area. I'm not some stranger. I live on Canyon Drive, a half a block south from the Gelson's. You know where it is. I can tell you that on Bronson, Canyon, Franklin, a number of the streets in our area, there are completely wrecked sidewalks, sidewalks that no person who has a disability could get over. And yet all of the talk around ADA compliance is this is a neighborhood council. I mean, if there's one thing that the neighborhood council could actually be effective on, it's sidewalks. And all of the talk is around unhoused people who are in a desperate situation without housing instead of something far more simple, which is repairing cracked sidewalks. So I, I, I encourage you to put your priorities where they belong. Um, the, the second thing I wanted to bring up was this idea of, it, it sounds like folks wanna create a myth about this silent majority on Facebook and Nextdoor. I don't come to these meetings because this is fun for me. I come to these meetings because I look at the people who live under that Gower underpass as my neighbors. That's how I see them. I own a home in this area. I see their homes. I feel for them. I want to help them. That is not a radical view and it is not an outlier view. 
we show up because it matters to us. If it mattered so much to these folks, they would call in. It's the least they can do. It's the, it, 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 it is the, the, the minimum amount of respect that they could pay. And the last thing I want to say is shout out to Jim. Jim, I come to these meetings all the time. I really dig your style. We don't always agree, but I dig the reasoned approach that you take to things. So just shout out to my homie, Jim. That's it. Okay, thank you, Gina. Hi, thanks for letting me speak again. Um, I spoke earlier about my children and the connection that I have worked so hard for them to make with our houseless neighbors in the community. And I hope that landed on some of you. I appreciate that you've all listened and engaged in this process. What I don't see in this council is diversity. I thought about joining this council tonight, but I'm white and this council is way too white for Hollywood. Oh, shut so up. That, shut up. People are on, so. Oh, that's right. People can't hear the words white people without feeling offended. Those who just told me to shut up, you need to step off this council and check your racist ways. Gina, I love you. <laughs> okay, uh, Christina. Let's see, Christina, go ahead, Christina. That shut up was an embarrassing display from whoever is on this council. Um, it sort of mirrors, you know, some really good moments tonight, but also a lot of sort of issues um, with the personalities on this board and also the inability to I think truly represent people who live in this neighborhood. You know, just to share a reminder here, this is a neighborhood council. This is a special meeting with a specific agenda. We are not here to listen to, you know, a circus of mansplaining about how things work. Um, some of you guys not even come prepared reading or educating yourselves on the motions that were brought up tonight. So here we are two hours over time. <laughs> and I just urge you guys, if you're going to be taken seriously, if you're going to want to have an opinion, even if you are a business owner or not, or anything else, if you have a stake in this community and advocating for it, just the minimum you can do in a special meeting that's very specific is to educate yourself so you're not wasting hours of our time here, uh, having George read word for word, 300 fucking words of, of commentary. Come prepared, do your homework, share an opinion that's valuable. Stop wasting our time and just try to do good work. Thank you. Uh, Tommy, all yours. Hey, hey uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Brandy for representing Nextdoor and Facebook. Uh, they're a very important constituency of this council. Thank you, Brandy. Um, thanks to like Jim, I think it was Jim who told uh, Gina to shut up when she said the words white people. Uh, you're really fragile. I mean, that is that is sad. That is got some serious issues. Um, talk about like racist. This is your board, y'all. This is the board that you are sitting on. Like whoever said that, maybe it wasn't you, Jim. It was someone else. But the recording was okay. Um. Anyways, uh, I like to make the point that it's incredibly offensive to me that y'all are. Um, like, I guess opining about. Uh, private property and the rights of private property owners when uh, literally um, there was like a genocide on this continent, like hundreds of cultures were wiped out so that private property could be instituted. It's not your right. It's a social construct. Um, there wasn't homelessness pre-colonization. It's entirely an artificial construct of white supremacy. So to come in here and say that, oh, we need to protect people's rights uh, is white supremacist when you are prioritizing the rights of private property over human beings that are made to live on a few feet of fucking concrete sidewalks. Okay, so, I, 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 I've asked uh, George, this time, please, I, I, please. I can't take people making one thing into another thing into another thing Yo, just Andrew, so they can rip everybody up, apart. Andrew, this isn't your comment. I, so, I, so I, George, the, the, come on. The, the the comment time was done, anyways, um, and I've I've asked numerous times. Please do refrain from profanity, and uh, I, I've asked that 
a lot of times. Uh, okay, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for opposing um, the Buscaina motion. Um, and I'm really glad that you were able to sort of see, see through the presentation from uh, Dennis and Gabriella um, and, and get to a place uh, to oppose that. Um, I'd like to echo some of the previous comments. Um, a lot of good arguments made. Um, and you know, oftentimes when these discussions are happening, there's a lot of arguments that get made that are not especially in good faith, right? Um, especially with the way that um, ADA accessibility is sort of weaponized, um, especially against people who are like even more likely to need it. Um, you know, we saw a lot of this from Buscaina staff tonight, sort of twisting real concerns into like this spear point that they then try to sort of direct towards our unhoused neighbors. Um, and I'm glad that you were able to see through that. Um, but you know, it's something that is going to keep coming up again and again. Um, and I'm sure you guys are going to encounter it again and again. Um, even if you look at something like the LA Alliance lawsuit, um, the group that filed that is a group that failed to intervene in previous lawsuits in LA. Um, and they filed the LA Alliance lawsuit specifically with the goal of establishing conditions in LA um, that would allow for the passing of criminalization ordinances for poverty. It's in their original briefs. If you go and read it, you'll see it. Um, and so I encourage you sort of as you continue to have these conversations to really kind of try and just look behind the curtain um, and see whether the people approaching you and the way that they're talking about these things, are they coming from a place of sort of moral certainty and clarity? Um, or are they really working to appropriate the language of care um, and community to, to, to weaponize those um, and really hurt people um, and instead of actually trying to, to uplift and provide real solutions um, for the community. Um, and I hope going forward, you consider that and, and keep doing things like opposing the Buscana motion from tonight. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, uh, we have pe People's um, City Council. Yes, that is me. I, I think whoever um, said shut up to Gina Violi, Viola uh, owes her an apology right now. That was that was unbelievably rude. Unbelievably rude. And and so like she because she said white. Which one of you said it? Own up to it, you fucking cowards. Okay, I, I've asked you guys to please refrain from from uh, profanity. Um, Lawrence, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, I just came with the intention of observing how this council meeting was going to go. However, just, I don't know, watch you all like stumble through like a simple revision and throw out syllables and synonyms like commandeering um, and then taking a vote on it without having public comment, which um, I'm pretty sure uh, Rosenberg's rules. Um, you know, it, it kind of demands that, but that's neither here nor there. I think what was uh, particularly shocking was interrupting Gina during public comment, telling her to shut up. Like, I mean, that's not just rude, but also undemocratic and uh, straight dickish. Like, please get it together. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Beanie Diggerson. Thank you so much for letting me speak. I am appalled that someone would interrupt public comment to tell Gina Viola to shut up as her comment about how this board is completely unrepresentative of Hollywood is entirely valid and should be taken in consideration. Uh, is, is somebody on the board willing to step forward and say that they did that? We'll be able to pull from the recording who said it. So this is all on public record. I can't believe that the board would be so completely unprofessional as to interrupt and tell a public commenter to shut up, especially after disregarding the fact that so many people have called into this meeting and, and using their time to somehow say that the people who didn't call in should be considered, who, who as far as we know, do not actually exist. And saying that people are commenting to you on Facebook and Nextdoor 
there is an avenue for people to send in emails to the neighborhood council board. They can send in their emails anonymously if they want. Where are the actual documented people who hate homeless people that you keep referring to? Where are they? You keep talking about them, but as far as I can tell, what's really going on is just that this board is not representative of the people who actually live here. That's a problem. And the fact that people on this board feel like it is totally within their, within their rights to interrupt public comment, to tell somebody making a point about the white domination of this board uh, that they should shut up is really indicative of what is going on here. And I think we should refer to what another caller said, which is that we are all on stolen land. This country was founded on stolen land and built on the genocide of native peoples and built by slaves, people from another continent who were imported here in chattel slavery to build this country. You have no respect for where- Okay, thank you, Beanie. You know what, um, I feel like, you know, I, we're, we're off in a whole distant planet. We, 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 we just need to get through the public comment and then we can be finished, okay? These ills are not on this board. We were to vote whether to pass something or not. I understand. We have public comment. We have to let public comment go. Uh, anybody who's already made public comment cannot make any more public comment. So please don't keep on uh, raising your hands. Bridget, go ahead. Hi, yeah. Um, I just want to uplift some of these public comments and... Uh, I wanted to offer just, um, you know, a few seconds of silence for whoever felt uh, that it was appropriate to tell someone in our community to shut up. So I'm going to shut up for about a count of five, and make some space so we can have a conversation about that. Does the person who said shut up want to speak. Okay, then I will use my time to be profane. Fuck you. Okay, so thank you, Bridget. Uh, Nigel, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, so I just want to make, um, I mean, thank you off the bat. Thank you uh, for those board members that made, you know, comments opposing this motion and, and for writing the CIS opposing it. I, I do appreciate that. And I appreciate you hearing us out. On the matter of public comment, it, it's, a, it is protected in the Brown Act and the First Amendment. Just because you don't like what people are saying Andrew and Michael, that doesn't mean we can't say it. Just because you think it's off time. This is a general public comment for non-agendized items. I can say whatever I want, which is also why I can swear. And for someone who you know is libertarian like yourself, maybe you would agree with the First Amendment and the marketplace of ideas and not interrupt public comment to shut down other people's opinions just because you don't like them. If you need a safe space, Go get it, but this isn't it. This is a public meeting where people can say what they want to say, right? So let's get that out of out of the way. And you know, we're we're angry, and you can feel that because this is an issue we should be passionate about. But I do appreciate the work that some of you are doing, and I appreciate you guys hearing us out. And I'll give the rest of my time. Okay, uh, Scott Peak. Yes, I'd like to say that I sit on the neighborhood city council as well. And anybody who tells any constituent to shut up should immediately recuse himself from the board and leave because that is not the democratic way. And anybody that tells anybody to shut up, especially sitting on a board, you should be ashamed of yourself. That's all. Okay. Uh, Christina, go ahead. Hold on. Could you hear it? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi, it's Christina. I just want to thank you all. I attend every um, 
council meeting um, that Hunk um, has invited everybody to because they are all open and they are all public. And I have to say, I appreciate your professionalism. I think that on some of the comments that have been made about how you can have free speech and, and, and curse and do whatever, um, this is a professional meeting. And I think that it's unprofessional, whether you're passionate about a subject or not, to use profanity. Number one, I'm a stakeholder. I don't want to hear it. And I am here spending my time. And number two, I just want to say how much I appreciate you taking your time as a board and coming to the decisions that you come to and thinking about them completely through. And I appreciate your time. And that's really all I have to say. And I thank you because this is now a four hour meeting because of a lot of public comments. And the last thing I wanna say is that these public comments have nothing to do with what's on this agenda. So can I, as a non board member, make a motion that we stop? <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... So this is uh, Lionel. Yes, I would like to thank you um, for having me um, this evening. I think that we could work together on solving this crisis on assisting on our unhoused neighbors who live across the city of Los Angeles. Um, I think that many of them are suffering and it's it's overwhelming for me to see that too when I'm out there, and I just want to hope that everyone could work together and let's put our um, differences aside and just find common ground because I like working together with everyone and finding peace and finding solutions instead of just fighting. It's just very sad. But thank you for having us today tonight, George. Okay, thank you. thank you very, thank you very much, for, uh, Lionel. Uh, we have um, Jessica. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to remind Christina who called in or whoever that was that these public comments, uh, she's right or not on the agenda because we were not able to comment on the agenda items in public comment before voting. And with that said, the voting is completed. Any sort of board members here who want to sort of maintain the reputation, you probably should hang out because with more board <laughs> Brown Act violations, inability to manage, um, rebuttals in response to public comment, which should not be happening, Michael, and which should not be happening, Andrew, you guys can just, you know, anyone here who wants to keep the reputation in place, you can just sign off and go to bed and not be complicit in this as the meeting minutes are published and this video comes to the city attorney. So have a good night and save yourselves. Thank you. And Colby Myers is the last person. Uh, go ahead, Colby. Yeah, I just wanted to say, whoever told Gina Viola to shut up needs to apologize right now and step down from this from this board immediately. This, uh, the, uh, your friend Christina noted that this was a professional meeting. Um, it, how many professional meetings do you have uh, where a uh, you get to tell a, a woman to shut up after her opinion on your whiteness? George, you're smirking. I wonder how many uh, professional meetings you've been a part of where uh, someone is allowed to interject and tell women to woman to shut up. How many how many spaces would that be allowed in? So that's the kind of space you're allowing on your board right now. I wouldn't want to be a part of anything with anyone that told someone told a woman to shut up when she was talking about this board's whiteness which is white as fuck. Um, so also, maybe okay. the board's like- So once again, us. once again, I, I, I've asked everybody here to please refrain from profanity. I, I understand that it can be uh, sometimes a, uh, a utterance, an excited utterance, but it really isn't. And I, when I ask you this, you should all please um, kind of treat each other in the same way uh, that, that I asked you. So uh, I, I don't, unless somebody really wants to, Brandy, you have your hand up. Uh, I really don't think we need to comment anything. I, I actually make a motion to adjourn. Does anybody 
Uh, I, I do have something important to say. Um, I'm not sure everybody who's in the audience recognizes that we have various representatives, homeowner reps, renter reps, and business reps. And it's completely appropriate that the business representative represented a business. Uh, it would be inappropriate for him to not recognize a certain aspect of business. Um, also, when it came to the term about mansplaining, um, we have to remember that we aren't sitting around a room, but normally this would have been, he's, it, it is board members explaining things to other board members. So I apologize if anybody in the audience thought it was mansplaining, as opposed to one of our board members conveying an aspect to other okay. board members. Okay, uh, I'll, I just want to leave with one last thing, which is, and, and Tom, I know you have your hand up, but I really want to kind of just move on, which is um, we have elections the That's candidate filing. Saying. The candidate filing began. If you want to know more about it, uh, you can go to myhunk.org/elections, and over there you will find uh, information to run for these seats. There's a lot of seats that will be open. I I really encourage you to to be on this board. I I, I really don't think there's such a thing as having uh, too little diversity. I mean, there's uh, too much diversity in opinions. There is actually a lot of diversity. I, I encourage diversity. I encourage everybody to come. Um, and if people want to discuss things further with me, you can email me at uh, president or george at myhunk.org and I will contact you and I will discuss anything with you um, because uh, I believe in the open uh, transmission and, and, and interchange. So, um, that's the whole premise behind the neighborhood councils. And uh, it's been a long night. So I, I, I make the motion to adjourn. It's 1058. Just imagine if we try to do this on a board meeting. Um, thank you all for coming. I will see you all soon. Have a good night. <laughs>